Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Digital Marketing, live show number 114. I am one of your hosts, soon to be hopefully not the only host today, uh, Lauren Gray with HospitalityDigitalMarketing.com. And as I said, this is show number 114, where weekly, for well over two years now, we have been coming to you with daily dosages of news, tech, case studies, um, gosh, techniques, lots of fun stuff associated with digital marketing, specifically for hospitality. Uh, normally with me is a eclectic crew of uh, other hosts, which I hope will join as time comes forward. We take on several different topics during the course of the week to discuss what's been happening that's of direct interest to you, not just to recap news or to uh, spew out what's out there as white noise and when you find out all these different publication sites, but actually try to dissect relevant news that may or may not have a direct impact to you now, but definitely will have an impact to you on the future. Uh, and with that, we try to cover and cover some of the topics for the week. Pardon me while I try to have some coffee as well. I am uh, under the weather uh, on the bad side of uh, uh, quick cold. I can thank the person that was in a doctor's office to sneeze all over me to have created this because I think that's where I got it from. But anyway, some of the topics that we want to bring in, um, one most in particular that I want to get started with, Facebook has named um, a new head of global travel. Most people don't really realize that uh, global travel or travel in general for Facebook, that there is actually a division and a department within the organization. You think of it mainly as a social media platform, all about using marketing on their social media platform. And as such, they don't have these divisions of industry within their infrastructure. But anybody that's familiar with or has worked with Facebook DAT program, which is dynamic ads for travel, realized that Facebook has a very definitive interest in uh, travel and has dedicated a lot of resources and thoughts into and programs and products into um, the travel space, as it were. This is a Skift article. Um, we know that with Facebook and, and one of the great blogs for associated with what's going on in Meta Search and what, what's being used in Facebook DAT programs is a platform. Uh, based out of Dallas called Cody, K-O-D-D-I. And they have a very good blog that really discusses in great detail, in understandable detail, uh, what exactly um, MetaSearch is and also, too, what dynamic ads are, more particularly within the Facebook environment. Um, I have the pleasure of speaking at HSMAI's Rocket program, which is the Revenue Optimization Continued Education and Training. We've done 24 cities throughout the United States and Canada. Um, hugely successful, 100% uh, referral, 97% satisfaction kind of stuff. And we break down in my example, one of what Facebook dynamic ads for travel are, is we have used to a static ad, an ad that says uh, rooms starting at $99, click here. And of course, when you click there, there's hardly any rooms available for $99 on any dates that they had put into there. And it's a very disappointing and quite frankly, very low converting and a great you know irritation. Uh, to the user who was hoping that they would have been able to take advantage of what you had advertised. Dynamic ads for travel shifts that. Um, what it allows you to do is create ads that actually draw from your inventory in real time with rates that are available in real time. And it even goes even farther than that. It knows your membership relationship if it's a brand. It knows uh, the locations that you're interested in because of targeting within the marketing infrastructure of Google Ad, uh, Google Ads, Facebook ads, and the filtering that is capable in, in Facebook for that. And so this ad is tailored to location, dates of interest, your membership relationship, rates that, that the um, advertiser feels that is realistic for you, which is why you're getting them in real time, and inventory availability that when you click on that ad, it literally has that inventory at that rate, at that location for those times available. So you can imagine the conversion increase from doing something like that. Now, there's a little, there's a lot of back behind the scenes that you have to do. Primarily, you have to make sure that your systems are integrated with your channel management program so that they can draw inventory availability, just like with Google Hotel Finder. Uh, speaking of which, there's a little bit of news items that uh, most people aren't aware of. Sojourn is going into a beta testing now of, uh, and the Sojourn is one of those retargeting camp platforms like Adara. They're going into a meta search program, uh, offering meta search to their users as well. <clears throat> told you a little bit under the weather, so apologies. I might have to cue the mic out every once in a while. Um, it's interesting because they're allowing for um, you to have access to all aspects of meta search and not just not qualified ones, uh, usually associated with enterprise level relationships. So you get access to Google Hotel Finder, you get access to Mr. Tim. 
Lauren Gray. How are you, sir? I thought you were still in Oslo. No, I saw I, a picture. I arrived, uh, I arrived back, oh, day before yesterday, but haven't slept much since. <laughs> uh, well, you and I will be a pair today because I am uh, on the worst side of crappy when it comes to a cold. I can thank a person in a doctor's office. Bless his little heart. Well, that's decides why you never to go to doctors. That's ex you know what? Thank you. you I'm just going to take that frame and I'm going to send it to my office and say, See, this is why I don't want to go to doctors. I'm sitting in the office and this guy, and I'm like, I felt the wind. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> And next thing you know, the next day, full blown, watery eyes, achy, stuff, um, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying life right now to say the well, least. That's okay. It. I'm wearing a parka today because we left a bunch of windows open last night and then the temperature dropped down into the 30s. So it's what? It's a little cold here uh, today. We've since closed the windows, but uh, oh, it I'm a into, little envious. Turned into I'm, autumn very, 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 very fast. No, we're still in the summer cycle, Indian summer, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it was uh, in the seventies when I left for Oslo on Sunday. Uh, okay. By the way, you did some very nice pictures. I have to give you a compliment. The pictures that you send when you do post them up on Instagram and on Facebook and so forth, really nice pictures. Good, good perspective stuff. Oh, thank so, you very much. Well, I think I think it's the artist. I think it's the artiste in you. You know, <laughs> that, 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 look, that eye. You have the eye. Me, I can have the world's best equipment in the world and take the world's crappiest pictures. I, I live for post editing. I can't take a picture to save my soul. <laughs> well, I, I don't do a lot of editing, but I do some. And some there's, there's certainly the odd Instagram filter on those. So, you know, um, it's not all just done with the eye on the first pass, you know? Uh, yeah, you're giving away secrets. But no, it really. And I'm always envious when you do go to Oslo because it is an area that I would like to eventually go to. Oh, it's a beautiful uh, city. Lovely city. Nicest people in the world. Um uh, Fantastic, uh, fantastic drink. Uh, um, good food, real good food town. Um, you know, it's, I want to be very fair. It's not London. It's not, you know, New York. It's not Paris. Uh, but it's a fantastic city unto itself. And it has this, um, it has this tremendous charm. I love the place. Uh, my wife went with me on a trip, uh, oh, a couple months back. And we just had a fabulous time the entire time we were there and would go back tomorrow. It's just a cool place. Uh, the one caveat for anybody who's never traveled to, you know, uh, Sweden or Oslo or any place in the Nordics is time of year plays immense role there because, you know, I've been there in February and I've been there in August just to give two contrasting times of year. And in February, the sun comes up at about nine o'clock in the morning Whoa. and goes down at about three o'clock in the afternoon. So it's, you know... It's very dark a lot. It's cool, don't get me wrong, but it's not, you know, because it's above the Arctic Circle or near to the Arctic Circle, you get that uh, situation. During the summer, the sun is up all the time. You know, it never really gets that dark. Uh, now, I went in August, which was after midsummer, so the sun was up until, you know, 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night and came up at about 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning. My understanding is if you go, my understanding is if you go in midsummer, literally the sun does go down but you know it just barely dips below the horizon so you basically have twilight for an hour or so before the sun comes back up so that i've would... not experienced that specifically but it's it's supposed to be pretty neat and uh you know sometimes during the year when you go there you're going to get about 20 hours a day of sunlight and sometimes you're going to get about six so uh, you gotta you gotta know when you're going and what that's like you know that would that would that would definitely uh mess with me if i did this we have friends that are down here in florida that uh, they have rv and they decided to take a um a road trip or a lifetime i guess a bucket list kind of thing where they went up through alaska but they drove from florida and spent oh, wow. four almost four months getting to and being through and coming back from there in their in their RV, and they had a Class A, you know, that the, the, it wasn't a trailer or anything like that. And um, the stories they told about what you're talking about, the sun shift and the it just throws you off. Where it's like it's sunny, but you're tired. You know, it's what time on the clock watch. Oh, but yeah, yeah. it doesn't match the outside environment. And uh, yeah, so well, um, and and I will tell you, when I went there in August, it doesn't help that we never quite got on on the time zone. And so you know. Because it didn't get dark till about eleven o'clock at night, my wife and I ended up being out till oh two or three or 
maybe a little bit later. Uh, <laughs> um, and then would sleep until, you know, 11 o'clock or noon the next day. Yep. Uh, so yep. we, we basically stayed on East Coast time the entire time. We oh, smart move. Time. <laughs> smart move. I got to say, life is so much better when you get to travel with the spouses for work or for anything. Just the, oh, you yeah. enjoy where you're at yeah. so much more. When you're, not, when you're not with them, it seriously is, is like you're just there for work and you really you miss opportunities and stuff. I mean, every place you get to travel. I mean, I just was doing the rocket program last week. You know, I had uh, Austin, which is an amazing city I already Great knew about. City. Got married in Austin. Love Austin. I mean, every time I keep moving back to Texas or have moved back to Texas, we always said if we move back to Texas, we should live in Austin, Houston, Dallas, both great places. Yeah, Austin, yeah, just yeah. such a cool place. Yeah. Uh, Charlotte and Atlanta, and it was uh, oh, sure. yeah, great, great places, great places to eat, great things to do. Um, I mean, you just you, but you don't as in, you don't enjoy it as much unless you're actually with someone that you get to share it with. I think, but that's right. Like, well, hey, you, did you get the new watch? I did not. I still have the old watch. <laughs> well, I have the two. Yeah, she had the I, Nike. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, just the two. Uh, oh, okay. Series two. Um, this is actually a knockoff band. This is not uh, one of Apple's uh, bands. It looks like the um, Nike band. Okay. I've got a couple of Apple bands and I've got a couple of knockoff bands. The difference between them being that the knockoff bands cost about 13 bucks and the <laughs> and the Apple bands cost not 13 bucks. New. Um, triple and quadruple that just for the basic ones. But right, yeah. right, right. Uh, um, but this is the Series 2, which is the waterproof one, but not the one with the cell phone. However, I have cracked the top of the screen. How the uh, hell do you do that? I have I had my Series 1 for three years, and it looks pristine on the screen, but the yeah. stainless steel, you can see the life. Yeah, I did a, I did a bad, bad thing. Um, and so mine is not waterproof any longer. Uh... <laughs> um, uh, but it's a great watch. I'm I'm a big fan of it. It's a it's okay. Really cool. I, can, I can honestly tell you, I I I think, and we've had this discussion on the show. This was the big announcement this year. Uh, not that I'm taking away from the processor, but this is the this is a real, truly usable, wearable, untethered experience that yeah. I've never yeah. had before. I I love. I mean, now when I walk the dog, I don't bring my phone. I mean, well, I can call, I can talk on this thing, everything. Well, I'm going to give I'm going to give credit we're due to a friend of mine um, who you know somebody we were at having a conversation and they were talking about you know they introduced the iPhone eight at the new show at the re most recent show and they introduced the iPhone ten mm -hmm. and somebody we were talking to said uh, you know what are they going to do about an iPhone nine and my buddy said my buddy said they've already introduced the iPhone nine it's the one you wear on your wrist yeah good point and I was like oh, good that's point. A point you know that's yeah. that's this this next, literally that's the next changed, iphone yeah this has literally changed my behavior in I'm the two sure weeks that i've had it it has literally changed my behavior because for me now uh my phone is no longer a mandatory carry along i i have this i can talk to siri i get directions i answer phone calls i get texts i right. do reminders it is for what i use most of my phone's engagement with now of course not the all the apps work as well but well, by screen far, size obviously yeah. it becomes a challenge at various points and the like but when yeah. you so i'm gonna do the thing i'm gonna do the thing you're gonna give me grief for this it's okay uh hold you know, on the bingo cards folks here it comes <laughs> hold on one second hold on i gotta find now, did, the right now when you when you upgraded the software for the series two because i know the series one couldn't do it it just didn't have the processor for it but did the series two get the siri screen on the on the phone um you know, to be honest, I don't use Siri on the watch very often, so I don't know the answer to that. I could probably test it in a moment. Um, hold on one second. But uh, there's, a, there's a new there's a new screen option called Siri Screen, and it's adaptive to. It literally makes this watch ultra functional for me because it keeps not you know your calendar stuff and your your weather stuff, but instead of having to go to the app to pull the weather out or to put it as an icon on your on your watch face to tap. It literally puts it into the stream of what you can scroll through or slide through on the screen. So it literally, you know, I keep saying the word literal. You just swipe up and you can see all the stuff that's going on and all the things you're interested in, things that you want to have on your screen. And it makes it so much more useful. So oh, that's very cool. That's very yeah. cool. So I can't find this post. Uh, this is unusual for me. Um, but hold on one second. I'm going to try one more thing. Um, so yeah, I also have. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry. Oh, I have to give you kudos. I, was, I heard on the Digital Marketing Council for HSMI yesterday that you're being uh, brought in to uh, organize the segmentation of the categorizations for the certification program. That's great. 
I yes, I am. I'm I'm working on that even as we speak. Well, not right at this immediate moment, but yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, but pretty quickly here, uh, and that's supposed to get wrapped up here in the next handful of weeks. Um, so I can't find this post. This is unusual. That is so Normally they come for with... you. Usually you pop these out of your hat. Like, I mean, they're just right there. You got them all. You got them all. So this actually, the, the one I'm looking for, I'm going to find it. I will find it while we're here on the episode, and I'm going to post a link to it. It was a podcast episode I did about a year ago because it was when Apple introduced the ear pods. And I'm not, I want to be very clear. I like Apple products clearly, right? There's no two ways about it. Yep. I am probably a bit of a fanboy from that perspective. At the same time, you know, I'm not religious about it, right. right? You know, if you prefer Android, go nuts, man. I don't, you know, good for you. <coughs> and no they got like... great products. If my wife has this S8 and it's a great phone. I mean, yeah, for sure. For sure. What, what I do think is impressive about what Apple did, though, and the point of this podcast was with the introduction of the ear pods specifically, and now the new watch, which wasn't true a year ago, but I basically was talking about Apple has just introduced the future of computing because what's going to change, and, and you just said that it's because of what you said about it changing your behavior that I think is the important part, Lauren, where, you know, today people touch their phones I forget the number, 30 oh. times a day, 40 times a day, 100 times a day. Yeah. Okay. Massive. Massive amount, right. All right, but if you have ear pods, if you have the little Bluetooth headphones that you never have to remove or whatever, when you remove, they, you know, they, they, the music stops or whatever, and they, you know, you can call, make calls or not make calls or whatever uh, um, when you take them out. Um, and, you know, a watch with cellular capabilities, that's the only computer you need and you will be connected constantly right so yep. people's behaviors will change a lot today we're already connected almost all the time and when you move to voice-based computing you're connected all the time you're connected yep. completely as needed and it's going to change people's behaviors which was really the point of the of the podcast episode right it wasn't necessarily that this is the greatest product in history it's that this is a signal of what we're going to see in the future where Everything just works all the time around you whenever you need it to. And that it becomes ever more seamless, this distinction between online and offline. Like that's the key takeaway. And yep. how customers will interact with these products is going to change because they can, right? Yep. Like that's a huge, huge difference. And, yep. you know, I don't know if it's going to be Apple that wins, I don't know if it's going to be Android that wins. I don't know if it's going to be uh, Amazon that wins. That's not the point. The point is how are customers going to act? Yeah. And that's undoubtedly going to change. And we saw this <coughs> glimpse into the future when they introduced the ear pods. Yeah. You know, if you've seen the movie. Well, you were big about that. You've made that very clear. I remember the podcast. I would enjoy that podcast, um, which anybody, if they don't know, Tim has a great podcast called Things Out Loud. Uh, I love it because it's snackable. You've always maintained it at a 10, 15 minute range. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is awesome because I, I kind of do the same thing with mine at 20 to 22 minutes uh, because that's, you know, attention span and ability to listen to podcasts. But um, well, and also figure when people work out or, yeah. <laughs> you know, or are commuting to work, they only have a limited period in which to do stuff. Right. Yep. And the returnability of them coming to a podcast goes down dramatically once they stop it to right. go back and finish right. it. So, that's exactly you know, right. I, I'm with you on that. I said, you were very adamant about the earbuds. And, Strangely, I didn't. I didn't get the iPod uh, earbuds, even though I wanted them. They always weren't available, so I ended up getting the Bragg ones that are the ones that fit into your ear. And uh, again, talk about changing what you do now. Um, they actually have a function where you have to turn on the ability to hear through it. Yeah. They do such a good job of noise cancellation that if you leave it, you can't hear anything around you. And uses the Bone speaker technology, so that you yep. hear the music really well. But I mean, one of the things was is as we travel a lot we try more and more ways to streamline down our processes oh, yeah. and move yeah. around. Yeah. And I've gotten to the point where I try to keep, if I can get in away with a four day trip on a backpack, I'm good. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. And um, this thing, we're putting the earphones on because you just on the plane, you just, the noise cancellation is a, is a lifesaver. Um, but these oh, things yeah. in the ears, in the ears and connected. And the cool thing is with this connects directly to it. Right. So exactly. to your point, 
to your point, even though it's not an Apple product, because that's the one thing about the iPod uh, ones are not, nice is that they connect to it as well. But these ones do it to it too as well. They'll connect to any Bluetooth now. And the the fact that I don't have to be trying to squeeze out my phone or whatever I'm in the chair, I'm just sitting there waiting for the plane to take off, and I go tap Siri, blah, play such and such music, boom, right, you know, right. and I'm in my world and waiting right. for you know. It really is. Those things are awesome to me. Those I are. Just- I did find the podcast. I just put a post up, a link up to it, by the way. Um, I, you know, I will tell you, I have one reason I don't like the earpods. I would like a pair. Um, I don't know if you know this. I wear a hearing Uh-oh. aid. Oh, yeah. You lost the sign. Sign nice down. All right, we're just going to take it down. Um, put it up there thinking maybe I can prop it up for now. <laughs> <laughs> I wear a hearing aid. I, I'm about to get a second hearing aid. And unfortunately, in ear. Headphones don't work for me when I'm out in public. Now I'm not, I don't have them in right now because I'm in my office and it's pretty quiet right. here. But uh, um, but unfortunately, out in the world, that's a problem for me. So I need something that goes over ear so that I can do it while uh-huh. I'm actually wearing a hearing aid. So uh, um, um, so the ear pods are not in play for me, but but I'm an outlier, right? Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> you but know, still all those for those most people who don't have to deal with that. That's not a big deal, right? And and the behavior is really the key point. Yes. You no, know, it is. It, it changing people's behaviors, the, the market success for it. Actually, one of the articles we threw in the hopper today, which you know I'm a, a huge fan of this, this uh, special needs traveling so forth. And, oh, yeah. And for those who have other stuff, there was an article on um, accessibility travel is uh, not mission impossible. It's an article from Amadeus. M- Here, I'll copy that out real quick. Um, yeah. yeah that I just always like to throw back into the hopper of discussion because as we get better, kind of a little bit like we're talking about with the technology usability, as we get better in communication with people on a one-on-one basis and can tailor our hospitality services to their particular needs when they come to the hotels and so forth, we can actually begin to do something that we as an industry have been, I think we miss on, and that is actually being able to accommodate people that have beyond the normal requirements for travel. That's right. That's absolutely right. Well, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 please go, go, go. When, when we talk about the aging population, many of whom still travel quite a bit, it is an immense market. I think I, if I remember from what I saw of this article when you sent it last night, what is it? It's, a, it's something like a $70 billion market in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, yeah it's 70 a billion. big, big, yep. big, big piece of business. And yep. we see it all the time with things like websites where you can't always easily say just show me the rooms that are handicapped accessible just show me the rooms or wheelchair accessible right show me the rooms that are uh you know um provide any kind of assistive small refrigerators for insulin um right right uh, 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 site assisted uh, uh accommodations for you know fire alarms and so forth yeah right right exactly so no it's a great point and it's something that is sorely overlooked and you know me, I, I get on my high horse about this all the time, is it's a good business. So you should do it because if for no other reason, you should do it because it's good business, but y'all should do it because it's kind of the right thing to do. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. with the full understanding, I mean, you know, there's a reason why the ADA refers to reasonable accommodation. Obviously, if you're a very small property or, you know, you're in a historic building or things like that, there aren't things that are practical reasonable and that's understandable but for everybody else you know your new build your uh your uh uh, um you know your um reflagging an existing property that's not you know a a historic building that has all kinds of limitations or things like that there's no reason not to do it and there's actually both human benefit and business benefit so why wouldn't you right right no very true and but don't think again from our discussions before we don't really account for that into our marketing strategy. It's a byproduct right. of something. Right. And and yes, we don't even in our infrastructure of how we normally sell ourselves, highlight the capacity of having people that might have more particular questions. We don't give them down a path to follow and navigate even on our own websites. Right. We passively refer to the obligations or ADA requirements in the sense that, uh, and almost treat it as a necessary evil because a lot of times right. that barrier of uh, that threshold of acceptance, they're just above where they, cut a standard desk out instead of a true design right. desk or right. a, a tub that doesn't have the right slope, but it has enough slope, right. little things like that. 
So uh, I, it's nice to see that they're beginning to see the real value proposition going forward, as you said, as the population ages and. Oh, Lauren, one of us froze. With properties that the, the, your, at least the European community is looking at that as a right. targetable thing that well, they, can, they can begin to find out. Nice. And I will tell you, I mean, this is one place where Airbnb pisses me off. In that, in that um, you know, I think hotels can learn a lot from Airbnb and the things that they're doing to make it easier for customers to find, make it easier for customers to book, you know, uh, make it a more authentic experience of the place when you go there and the like. So I think you can learn a lot from Airbnb. I also think it's true that a lot of Airbnb hosts are not playing on a level playing field. They're not meeting the same requirements, you know, with regard to assistive technologies, uh, with assistive uh, um, uh, design or the like. You know, they're not necessarily ADA compliant because they don't have to be because it's not a reasonable accommodation for a homeowner. Well, that's right. great and all. But if you're not selling it as a home, you're selling it as <laughs> an accommodation. You need to play by those same rules. And I think yes. that's a place where, where while I'm entirely... I, I'm probably going to make some enemies on this one. I have no problem with, um, you know, local local bureaucracies, local uh, uh, jurisdictions not regulating Airbnb from the standpoint of selling it. Right? I think people should be well within their right to put their you know properties out there on Airbnb. I have no issue with that. I also think that they should be held accountable to meet requirements for things like ADA and fire safety and you right. know. Uh, you know, duty of care types of things that hotels do, because if you're making your home available for somebody to stay in, whether you want to be a hotel or not, you are one and need to play yes. by the same rules. Yes. And so that's a place where I think Airbnb has gotten away with, you know, frankly, murder. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I did find, um, I, no, I don't have the website. There was a discussion in an article <laughs> that, um, in uh, the Northwest, go figure, they would do this, that there was a growing um, uh, sentiment or action on Airbnb hosts, they buying defibrillators. Which oh, I interesting. thought was a wonderful twist. Oh, interesting, yeah, yeah. yeah. That there was, a, there was a cumulative discussion with the Airbnb community, because you become a community with the hosting and so forth. And they were talking about the expansion of using defibrillators or having the defibrillators in their accommodations as a part of the value add proposition of people staying with them, not under the contention, hey, Mr. Robert, not under Robert the contention cool. that they're only going to be catering to them, but just the fact that they have that as a additional safety feature. Right, as a safety accommodation. Absolutely. And, and that's the place where I think Airbnb has done a good job. That's a great example of the kinds of things where I think hotels could learn from Airbnb, where they are often, not always, certainly not always, but they are often really good at being community focused and doing what is right for the community. And it's, you know, it makes for a great selling feature also because right. people go, wow, aren't these guys cool that they think of things like this? Right. And right. I think that that's something that a lot of hotels could learn from. I also think they should be held to the same regulatory standards for yes. safety and security and things yes. like that, that they're not. Right. Yes. And a kind of accommodations and the like, uh, a system of accommodations and the like. Robert, Robert Cole, we didn't welcome you before you got here. Yeah. I'm I'm sorry I'm late, but you guys mentioned elderly people traveling, and I, I had to rush and get it. <laughs> and here is our token representation of elderly people traveling, Mr. Robert Cole. No. <laughs> you whippersnappers. You yeah. young whippersnappers don't realize. I think if we all put our cards on the table, we wouldn't be too far from center on any of us. <laughs> I, I was trolling, I was trolling you guys. I both of you guys. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I, I was trolling both of you guys in the chat, and you didn't even realize. So no, I didn't see no, anything I said, from I said you. To, I think uh, our spam filter must have shut you down. I haven't seen yeah, a thing from oh, you. Really? Oh, I complimented you on modeling your Violet Beauregard Halloween costume this, this morning, Tim. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, you might be dating yourself. I don't know who Violet Beauregard is. Oh, my God. You, have not, you are obviously not a fan of Roald Dahl. And Charlie oh my and the God, Chocolate is, wait, Factory. Is, she, is it Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? Yes. Oh, okay. Violet. Uh, I know who Violet is. Sure. So, <laughs> yeah. so I have to tell you a funny story. We're going to digress, but then we do that here from time to time. Uh, That's why I'm, I'm here. <laughs> and I'm opening myself up for mockery galore on this one. I fully uh, recognize what I'm about to do to myself, but that's okay. 
Um, I saw Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, the original, right? Uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is the original, right? No, the original with, with Gene Wilder was Willy Wonka. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Wonka, Chocolate Factory. So I saw yeah. Willy Wonka and the oh, Chocolate Factory. Actually, I may be wrong on that. Well, I'll, I'll Holly I isn't here to fact check it. I will have to do it myself. I saw the Gene <laughs> Wilder version in yes. the movie theaters when I was a very small child. It's the first movie I ever recall seeing because it was wow. either it was either it was either a new release or it was a recent re-release. But it was you know um, the first movie I recall seeing, and I was probably three years old. Right, I was very, very young when when my mom and took me with my brothers and my sister to see this. Nineteen seventy one. Nineteen seventy one. So I was, so I was actually two and a half years old, actually. Right, and the movie terrorized me. My mother had to p take me from the theater because it frightened me to within an inch of my life. I screamed and screamed in horror. It was the scariest thing I ever saw. My brothers bastards that they were uh, picked up on the fact that the movie scared me, especially the part where the girl got sucked up the tube. That's Veruca Salt, right? Yeah. And would chase me around the house with the vacuum cleaner hose. You know, they'd turn on the vacuum nice. cleaner and come after me with the vacuum cleaner hose, telling me I was going to get sucked up the tube like Veruca Salt. Oh so, my gosh. And that's why, to this day, I do not vacuum. <laughs> and, and you watch the movie that story. Okay. Huh? <laughs> okay. So Tim and I have similar traumatic uh, film backgrounds. <laughs> so my first movie, and I'm not that old because Fantasia was produced in 1940. <laughs> it was a re-release of it. <laughs> but I don't. I don't know how old I was. It was in the late 60s. They played Fantasia and that was my first and let me tell you that is a very frightening movie for a, for a young child for, for a young child it's funny yeah. the things that scare you little kids that you know now I see Charlie and the Chocolate Factory or Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory whatever the name is and I think it's cute and all that kind of stuff right. but yeah. I don't have the love of that movie that a lot of people do because for years I refused okay. to watch it because it uh, scared the crap out of me but my, but my traumatic I like movie. the movie <laughs> oh yeah my my traumatic movie was The Wizard of Oz. Oh, sure, and, sure. And so when the it was Wicked really Witch presented? When, when, when you thought what <laughs> yeah, it was 1939. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I was 43 when it came out. <laughs> but no, so anyway, I would I would watch that. The world was all black and white. Yeah, yeah, we would watch that in our living room on our black and white television. <laughs> And again, older sister, older, you know, sibling, five older years old. Older siblings, man, they're the worst. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tina, if Tina's not watching, <laughs> but she knows. She knows now. And I, I think now she feels remorse, but I'm still not sure. But sure. She, and a, she and a friend of hers developed this elaborate plot where, A, they knew that I loved the Mickey Mouse Club. So they started writing letters to me as Mickey Mouse, which was very oh, cool wow. and very and very nice, very enriching and yeah, you know, wow, sure, sure. connect you know, connected engagement sort of thing. Sure, sure. Until one weekday afternoon when we went swimming out of the lake and we're driving back, and she and her friend go, Look out there, because we're in the I'm in the back seat of the station wagon. Look over the lake. What's that flying? It's like, what? What's that? It's the Wicked Witch of the West. And I know. Oh, ah! no. So oh, no. they they actually were going and getting into costumes, hiding in the trees behind them, and switching around so they would oh, be coming up no. and then see the. Oh, just absolutely terrorized. <laughs> so let's fast forward to probably the fall of 1978. And I'm at my freshman year at a. Cornell Fun. University, everybody. <laughs> Bingo! <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I'm there, and hey, it's you know, ten thirty at night, and what's playing in the you know in the Student downstairs? Center. Yeah. Well, in the downstairs, okay. like lobby or kind of hangout, you know, lounge sort of thing. Um, TV lounge is Wizard of Oz, and so you know, I sit down to watch it because we had a black and white TV. I had no idea, oh. A, that it turned into color, oh, <laughs> and sure. B, that witch's face was green. 
(laughs) All I can say is if I had seen the witch's face being green in the late sixties, I would not be with you. I would have (laughs) gone. Absolutely. (laughs) It would have. Yeah. I, it, it, well, I it's, don't it's think nice that, I could have survived that. So it's, still it's one of nice my favorite know, movies, but yeah. It's, it's nice to know we're not, I'm not the only one with a traumatic childhood film oh, experience. Guard by, by siblings. Uh, but I'm, about I'm by sitting siblings. there at 18 years old, just horror struck, you know, slack jaws. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I remember the first time I, I don't, I don't remember how old I was, but I remember the first time people talking about how much they loved that movie. Uh, the, Willy Wonka yeah. and the Chocolate Factory. And all I could say was like, are you people insane? That movie's yeah. a horror show. You know, and everybody's like, how do you not love that movie? I'm like, that movie scared the crap out of me. Like every Ro- <laughs> great Roald Dahl book. I mean, yeah. So I actually <laughs> love his stuff now. Oh, so I. I loved reading right. it to my kids. Oh, I stuff, loved it but, back you know. I loved it back then too, with you know. But that movie just absolutely James you know. and the Giant Peach. Yeah, oh, this guy with these movie. giant bugs. Matilda. Yeah, Matilda, great. Great, great stuff. Hey, anyway. Robert, I wanted to ask you, with everything going on in Lubbock, was everything okay? I mean, did, was there any... Ah, yeah, very... Uh, it, it was. My daughter was actually in a car um, driving back. And Lubbock has a... Um, Texas Tech, um, they had... Well, it wasn't really a live shooter. Well, it, it was. Oh, it was a fellow oh. with a with a uh, with a gun but yeah we got a we got text messages and phone calls and things like that saying there is an active shooter um on the campus so our daughter immediately called us which is a very thoughtful mature thing yeah, to do yeah, yeah. and say yeah we're going home sort of thing um they apprehended the guy my daughter took a picture out of her apartment window at the parking garage which is maybe you know she's on the what east side of the of the football stadium and he was you know apprehended in a parking garage on the north side of the football stadium so oh, wow. not that far not that far yeah. away but um, that's, that's yeah, very scary glad to hear that she is okay yeah okay glad to hear yeah, from that too. yeah that was it was actually though a situation where it was a freshman who um apparently had a had some sort of drug problem or something i think had been reported by somebody in his dorm or something like that um that of having a weapon um, sort of thing. So somehow I, um, uh-huh. and, and unfortunately the, uh, the officer, you know, the campus security fellow who brought him in, I don't know if it was concealed. He was too young to carry concealed weapon, that sort of thing. They are allowed on campus, but I don't think, you know, whatever the situation, he actually went to the police station and then shot the guy with his gun. So he somehow got, you know, arrested and taken to the, um, you know, the campus security station and then, mm. then shot the guy and then tried to get away and just like not really yeah, bad yeah. situation. That's, that's yeah. It's, but, it's, but it's, not someone out there who is out there, right. you know, out there, you know, trying no, but, to but, hit but, 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 things, but still 90 uh, minutes uh, of, of some, of somebody on the loose. And again, tech very good with the communication of what's going on, what you should do, which um, even on that, I think, hotels are going to have to up their um up their game on that yeah. i mean there are lots of really really interesting things getting thrown around in a in las vegas well, right now in terms of with, with uh with with austin when i was there for rocket just last week uh the hotel where we were hosting at um is right next to what would be the the uh, austin city limits which is the first weekend now this weekend um, it's the second weekend yeah. zilker um, park you were by zilker park yeah yeah so uh, yep. at the window garden there, and and it's a conference there and so forth. And I noticed that there was a, a uniform presence in the lobby, and you know it's not unsettling, but from our perspective, anytime there's uniform presence, usually because there's an active incident that's going on. You just don't have the yeah. uniform staff in, a, in an establishment unless there's something going on that causes them to be there. And this was just their attempt to calm down the fact that just with the Las Vegas event that happened, tragedy, not event, tragedy that happened yeah, yeah, yeah um that you know they were aware of the fact that they were the next big open venue event coming up and that you know just to be uh attentive to the, the, the concerns they went over yeah, and brought uh, uh off-duty personnel in uniform to be on property to show that there was a presence in case something were to unfortunately right. happen yeah, um yeah. and it, it's weird because i mean we talk about marketing and everything else with this and, and even though i highlighted it as a feature for the past couple of shows we really didn't hone in on it as much is how how do you plan for it in the future in the sense of, of being prepared to it like uh, i've quoted mike tyson everybody has a plan until they get hit <laughs> you know mm-hmm, right and then then it goes out the window because it ain't what you think it is and the secondly is how do you step from that once the tragedy has passed or the event has passed 
and into some sort of numerical because you still have to be in business. You know, you still have to, you know, we talked about the hurricanes to some brief degree. That's a logistics issue. If you can't fly or the product's not available for service, that kind of closes you down until you can do something. But if you are capable of doing business in a, in a location that has suffered this type of event, tragedy, um, how and when do you step from behind that shadow? So I, I will tell you, based on my experience with this, I have a little bit of experience with this. Um, first, first, let me take a huge step back before I start that. Um, you know, I don't think there is a one size fits all solution to these. I think they depend Absolutely on the specifics of, of what the incident is and things along those lines. Um, you know, um, it's very hard to know precisely what to do. I think what's important is that you have a communications plan. You know, you have a, you have ways of marshalling your resources and saying, where are people going to congregate? Where are people going to be? And how do we get the word out to people? And what's appropriate to say and the like. Um, I, when I worked at the leading hotels of the world, um, we were, of course, uh, we repped the Taj Mumbai, which was attacked in 2008. And there was a terrible terrorist attack there. The general manager of the property, who was somebody who I knew was killed, um, you know, and it was deeply, deeply troubling. We had had, not because we were particularly uh, ahead of the curve on this, but just because some, some of us had had some experiences with this, we'd had communications plans in places that basically said, you know, the first thing we tried to find out was where was the authoritative source of good information? And then we made that available on the website to people to say, you know, here is a number you can call to if you need to get in touch with us. If you're looking for a guest at the hotel, here is the numbers you can reach. And here's the website where you can get the authoritative source of information. And, at you know, and apart from that, we really, you know, are here to help. Give us a call if we can assist in any way. But that was all we did, right? Because, because it was a terrible situation. We didn't know a lot when it was ongoing. Right. Um, here in America, so this was happening in India. Here in America, it was uh, the Wednesday <coughs> night of Thanksgiving weekend. So, right. you know, we didn't have a ton of people available. But we had, this is not a funny story at all. Um, I, what I'm about to say, clearly what I just said is not a funny story at all. Um, but I was interviewing a candidate for a content management role, um, in my time at Wyndham in 2002. And I asked the, um, um, the, uh, uh, I asked the candidate for, for the job, um, you know, the typical interview question about tell me a time when you had to deal with a stressful situation or something to that effect, you know, one of those kinds of questions. And she said, well, I was part of the content management team at American Airlines on 9-11 and dot, dot, dot. And I just sat there like, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I have no response to this, you know, like, yeah, yeah. right. Um, but the takeaway from that uh, was, unfortunately, these are situations, regardless of whether it's terrorism, regardless of whether it's natural disaster, regardless of whether it's some lunatic with a gun, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter. I think it's unfortunately a reality that we live in a world where th bad things will happen sometimes. Right. And it's incumbent upon each of us, not from a marketing perspective, but from a communications perspective to say, are we prepared to respond to these things? How do we point people to the best, most accurate information that helps them? And how can we provide a supportive role in whatever way is possible. Don't merchandise around it. Don't market around it. Don't, you know, how can right. you help? And then, right. and then as much as possible, stay out of the way, I, at least from my perspective and with my experience, less is genuinely more on this right. beyond over communicating in as much as you're able to. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. But and, and the, the numbers of, of situational, you know, permutations and combinations operationally are just, yeah, they're unfathomable. It can be <coughs> anything at, at any time, and so um, now what? You know, some of the you know issues that are, are being raised with MGM, and MGM is getting sued now, sure. um, you know, by sure. people for not doing this or not. Which, yeah, so which is going to happen. Oh, it's always going to happen, either frivolously or legitimately. I mean, correct. Right. Who, who knows? But you know, some of the things they're saying is apparently the gentleman, and again, he was a high roller 
had his right. do not disturb sign for an extended period of time. That whole, you know, respecting the guest's privacy versus yeah. legitimately is somebody, you know, need help, you know, because I don't know, you know, you do the phone calls, things like that, they don't answer. Right. You need to have processes and policies to right. deal That's with right. all of those, all of those scenarios. Um, even the security, I mean, and, and these things are so complicated. You look at the Las Vegas police trying to put together a timeline. Yeah. They've had everything from the security card being shot after he started shooting to minutes before yeah. to right. people going to the wrong floor, all these different, you know, <laughs> different things when, you know, when seconds count, it's a, uh, it's an outrageously difficult situation, wow. and the and the reality is that security guard was up on that floor, responding to a door ajar, right sort of yeah. thing, checking yeah. on what's wrong with the door. So MGM, you know, yes, you can say, oh, they didn't check the do not disturb sign. You know, yes, but they checked the door ajar. You know, so it isn't like yeah. they're just sitting there going, hey, we don't care what's going on upstairs, and no. that probably that got saved. God knows how many how many lives, right? right? Well, so, geez. so very very complicated. Um, just one other thing was adding. You know, people are saying, well, they need to do a TSA type check security to go in and out of the hotel, have all your bags, go through metal detectors, and you go, wow. And it's not just hotel. You know, yeah, yes, yeah, you yeah. do that in many office buildings, but that's because that's a controlled non-public right. area. This right. is a you know somewhat quasi public uh, uh, well the um, one thing i want to say real very very quickly and lauren it goes back to, it goes back to your comment a moment ago about mike tyson's quote you know again the takeaway that we took from the mumbai thing the takeaway that we took from talking to this woman who worked for american on 9 11 etc uh there is an old um dwight eisenhower quote that i think is very applicable in these situations which plans are useless planning yeah. is essential yeah. Right. The plan itself might get thrown away as things occur because yeah. the circumstances go, well, this part of the plan doesn't make any sense. This part of the plan doesn't make any sense. This part of the plan doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But having gone through the process of planning to say, what do we do if, how do we handle if, what do we do when kind of thing is right. very helpful because then you're not making stuff up on the fly oh, when you don't right. know simply, when, simply when who's there's so much is so, uh, yeah, you know, simply, so you know, who's in charge, the chain of right. command. Oh, right. it's the manager on duty. That's right. Because again, this happened at what? Um, yeah. Nine, 10 o'clock at night sort of thing. Right. Um, yeah. Well, who's we in had... charge? If that person's out of position, they're somewhere, you know, they're, they're, involved in the actual incident who takes it who's got it and then here are all the steps that you need to you need to handle and you start going well these smaller properties and things like that do they aren't as complicated they should be able to do it but still a lot of hotels probably not where they need to be in terms of you know kind of these right. these plans so. and using that, that by incident specifically i mean what we did have in place that worked i mean the message we put together was put together on the fly but we knew who was going to put the message together, right? The, right. Uh, getting the content on the website, we knew whose job it was to do that, even though it was a holiday weekend. We knew, right. um, we knew who was responsible for vetting and saying this is the authoritative source of the information that we're going right. to post, and we knew how to communicate to folks who were in the call centers. This is how you handle these calls, you know. Right. Um, so, but we did not have a plan that said in the event of a terrorist attack, do this, that, you know, it was more, we'd work right. through in the event of emergencies, this is what the plan is. And I think, you know, right. five of the 12 things on the plan flat out didn't apply. And there were two or three things that we were like, oh crap, we never thought of that one before. But well, because we had a process, we kind of knew, okay, here's what we do with it. And I think that's the real Yep. how you prepare and personally. and now and with digital marketing you know pulling ads and things oh, like yeah, that yeah well, all of a sudden the context process. sensitivity of having your hotel name established and then <gasps> having something grossly inappropriate right, right. Uh, right. and that goes yeah, back to what i think is up there two two aspects that i want to touch on one was robert right to your point not to make minor what you just said tim i think it's absolutely phenomenal you always have these great statement plans you use this planning is critical um, he, gets, he gets lucky every once in a while. Yeah, right. So, you know, you blind blind but if he says, says, not every exactly now and again. But the, if you, the if you write is, enough blog posts, you will have one that will cover the topic. <laughs> right. Infinite, that comes infinite number of monkeys. 
Yeah, it's infinite knowing what you're given infinite amount of time. They will build a nuclear bomb. Hey, so, you know, we've all come from the, the heritage of our industry where the marketing plan was this tome that was placed on the shelf in the marketing office. And it was, you know, we opened the door and those angelic sounds and a little beam of light hit it when you ever looked at it. And you had to dust it off and open it up as if it was a Bible to <laughs> chapter 12, page two, you know. Um, only to find out that as years went by, all they did was erase the last year's number and put this year's number on it. Nothing ever changed. Plus, plus um, 10%. Plus 10%, yeah. right. Um, but, but to your point, I think there's a soft underbelly, especially for independent hotels, to not have a safety net for these types of things because brand to their credit have crash kits. Brands to their credit have pr pr crash protocol, um, which cuts through the clutter of the normal political hierarchies of brand uh, ineffectiveness when something like this happens at a brand hotel there is a brand team that comes in yeah. when there are these kind of things and they take these but but to your point Robert little things logistic things that oftentimes especially on the independent hotel side that are not being directly handled by them their scheduled posts their scheduled advertisement their scheduled retargeting campaigns all those things somebody needs to go wait we got to call the agency and shut that off because the agency right. isn't watching everything every moment. Right. And, and right. To, to, to the agency, they might not, not be aware of the fact that this is happening to one of their clients at the time that it's happening. So right. hopefully they're good enough that they are, but who knows? Um, right. So it really and is the onus is on the property. Facebook and Google are trying to get better at that too. I think right. um, in this case, both of them shut down you know, all the contextual ads. Right. Yeah. I, I, right. I think I mentioned last so, year, that's yeah, we that as well. before. <laughs> Adara, when the, the tragedy happened in Las Vegas, sent out a notification to all those that were using the Adara account of how they suspended all retargeting campaigns associated with the Las right. Vegas market, right. which right. I thought was uh, very thoughtful of them to be that thoughtful of. So in that right. sense, I thought it was very good of them in that. Uh, but yes, to your point, plans are useless, but plans are critical. Mr. Ed at home. Yes. Job. Holla. Hello. <laughs> what are you? We're we're having a fairly heavy conversation, Ed. Uh, we're talking about wow. you know, we're talking Surprise. about we're talking about disaster, uh, disaster. Yeah, like how you deal with certain circumstances, you know, like the things that happen in Las Vegas, or things, you know, from a from a business continuity perspective, and from a from a you know marketing perspective, in the sense of how do you get the right communication out to people? How do you shut down, <laughs> you know? your remarketing ads or things like that and, you know, anything that might be inappropriate from that perspective. Um, so just wanted you to be aware before you, you know. <laughs> well, and, and in those and in those situations, almost everything is inappropriate, right? I right. mean, yeah. Right. I mean, from somebody, you, know, you can't really even anticipate the context of what's right. happening in the moment. So it's like, you know, well, take it I all can... down. If I can lighten the mood just a tiny little bit, uh, you know, one of the the first time I ever experienced contextual advertising, uh, and this goes way back. This is like 2001, 2000, somewhere in there. Um, um, you know, it was one of the very early products that looked at content. You know, it was content targeting, right? So it was con um, ads that would appear alongside content or things like that. But in this specific case, and I, I don't remember the platform that did it then. Uh, they probably don't exist any longer. That you know, they were bought by Yahoo or AOL or something along the way. Um, but um, what it did was it actually scanned the content and it made uh, it made words within the content blue links that if you hovered over, you got a little pop-up ad for, you know, whatever that topic was. So the, they were demoing this. This was fantastic. The vendor is demoing to us the um, their product and the like. And, you know, they were like, you know, pull up something with the word whatever. And I, you know, so we pulled it up and we're like, oh, isn't that cool? And then we pulled up bank and there, the ad came up for bank, you know, here's this bank, blah, 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 blah. And they were like, you know, isn't this great? So we were checking afterwards and we found one of them on an article about a bank, you know, and it was all about a suicide bomber on the West Bank of Israel. Mm. And yeah. this ad for the bank. And we're going, yeah, that's actually really terrible. Like, yeah, right. you know, probably not, you know, and I was like, I see the power of contextual advertising. I think it's a really good thing. Oh, by the way, this is God awful. There needs to be a better system than this in terms of understanding right. what the content is really about, you know? <laughs> so you gotta, you gotta watch. And, and Robert, that's precisely to your point of, 
you don't know what's going to be inappropriate, right? So right. That, that's where we found, you know, in the Mumbai situation in 2008, less is definitely more because you might you might find yourself treading into territory where it's going to be offensive or it's going to be hurtful right. entirely well, it depends. unintentionally yeah. you have you have a great a great ad, it happens to do with families and a family is involved or yeah, yeah. a young person or an old it's just my my perspective the safest bet is you've got to you've got to pull everything until yeah, yeah. you know what's going on yeah. the context that you know you do not need to well, be and you your should re- that badly you know through the right. whole you know through and the you whole should thing. relook at your conflict through the lens of what just happened and you're you're breaking yeah, up really really badly by the way how about now? There you go. Better. Oh. That was better. Better. Okay. Mm, but what I'm not. saying is, is you should all. Okay. Well, let me try again. I'll be back. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sorry, we're, getting little, up. we're getting a little Max Ed room there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of looks like Max. Ed. Well, <laughs> one question. One question I do want to get in because yeah. I, I wanted to ask about it is that I'm noticing now as we're getting to the end of budget season, which is always a <laughs> which normally ends about the third week of January yeah. <laughs> for, for some right. properties. And, and for some properties. <laughs> Have you noticed a conservatism in, in who you're dealing with as to what they're looking at as to not the growth of their business, but the growth of their investment into uh, future action, that there's a, a tepidness about advancing uh, new projects, advancing new platforms kind of thing. Are you seeing a little bit of that hesitancy grow into the next next year? It's yeah, the plateauing of Revpar is yeah. uh, is people are wrestling with, right? Yeah. So yeah. If, yeah, generally if I, would, just... I would I would agree with that. There are a couple of cases I would point to where they they see it as an opportunity for investment for the longer term because they think some right. of the competition is being more conservative. But I think yeah. even in those cases, it's a direct response to the market ain't what it was, right? Or yeah, isn't likely yeah. to be what it's been for the last couple of years. And, Sorry, and, and you were going to say something. Over, your back. Oh, you're, I'll just add real quickly. Year over year rate growth is not getting pushed that much. It's only right, up right, maybe one percent right. now in recent weeks, right. year over year, which is not strong at all. So, and that's you know, nationwide. So. Yep. Right, Ready, so do, I move, do I yeah, move? Do I move smoothly good. now? All right. There you go. Good. Good. So yeah. what I was saying is, when things like this are happening. Um, <laughs> You also should look at your content how you work things. It's like right now sending out a new blast to California about a really hot deal would be a bad idea. Oh, come on. I don't know. What, what's over the internet at home? Oh, okay. it, is, it is max headrooming quite quite. Yeah, you start out with it. <laughs> no, no. Let me restart. I'll be back. Yeah, what's what's cool though is the the ceiling fan is like jumping around yes. like crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, <laughs> I think what Ed was saying was, you know, if I caught that, you know, for those of you who are uh, listening, uh, 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 was, he you speaks know, back to If you have an email blast right now that's talking about really hot deals in L.A., you know, really hot deals in California. Oh yeah, that would be you know massively inappropriate, right? So you got to watch right. for stuff. Right. Yep. Yep. Ed, All right, try to get Ed. All right. Hello now. Hi, Ken. Seems good now. That was All right. good. It was Chrome. He he had to, he had to get oh, a, he God. had to get another he had to get another child on the treadmill to That's just right. come on get, faster. Get, get faster. He had to close forty seven tabs. Actually, uh, I had nothing open. I just think Chrome was just choking on itself. Got it. Well, uh, Chrome will open forty seven yeah. background processes without yeah, you know it. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, and it sounds like you guys caught on to what I was trying to say. It's like let's not talk about hut deals in California right. and you know things like that. Right. Um, and and you do have to think about that because there's a lot going on in the world right now. Right. 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 Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The the main takeaway I think you know we've all been talking about is just it's important you have plans for these kinds of things. Even if you then have to adapt the plan on the fly, the process will be really helpful in getting you, you know understanding what do you do right when these right. kinds of scenarios yeah. Yeah. and that and that is critically important in these situations when you look at the yeah. situation in Puerto Rico US Virgin Islands yeah you don't have electricity you don't have right. water right. you have all that sort of thing things get really complicated with it. you just oh well we'll just send a text message to everyone no, right. that might not 
Okay. You know, that okay. might so, not. So may may not so, now may not be the time to talk about a 199 timeshare package. <laughs> right. But right. Let, me, let, me, let me ask you, this might go into the gray zone, so to speak. Do you feel it opportunistic? The gray zone. That's what we should call this show, the gray zone. I actually have the, the gray zone. zone. The gray zone. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, it, do you feel it is bad opportunistic or neutral optimistic that I that you can target people that had an interest in travel into a market that no longer is available for travel? Let's say Northern California, uh, San Juan. Don't feature, hey, you're thinking about going there, but you can't now come here. Not that but simply just to target them on the opportunity that your product is available for elsewhere. Do you think that's a good? The only thing I'll say about that is, listen, we all saw that one vendor that put out a message that we all felt for the same thing. The first half of it was like, oh, this is really nice that they're doing this, well thought out. And then you got to the bottom where they get that little of opportunity piece, and we all reacted the same exact Ed, way. Did I lose everybody? Ed, we discussed. I lost everybody. Now, Ed, now, Ed, I think you're now doing... Alvin and the Chipmunks do Max Headroom. <laughs> so. Come on. Um, it was a little yeah, rough. I, I, I think we get. I think we get the idea again, though. That yeah, it's it's. This is the advice I give. I, I teach a class on this at Rutgers. I think I've talked about this on the show, uh, specifically called personalized digital experiences. And it's. Um, did we lose Lauren as well? Yeah, Lauren froze. Lauren yeah, Lauren froze and Ed's frozen. semi frozen. Um, yeah. So, so your picture's frozen, and uh, yeah, your voice is. So, um, um, the, the oh, now we, yeah. Um, um, there's an analyst at Forrester Research, uh, Julie Ask, who talks about, um, you know, think like big mother, not like big brother, right? Just because you have the data yeah. to do certain things doesn't mean you should. You know, are you doing it to be helpful? Are you doing it to be useful, et cetera? Um, you know, and one of the things that I always recommend when you're dealing with these kinds of things is have somebody in the room whose bonus isn't based on doing the thing yeah. to give their opinion, right? Because if they're, if your bonus right. is, everybody's bonus is based on, we got to do whatever we can to drive revenue in these tough times, then... Yeah. You know, you're probably going to do some things that are candidly shitty, right? This, so don't this do is, that. Like, yeah. Have somebody in the room who can go, wait, folks, are we sure about this? Like, this is icky, you know? Right. <laughs> this is the classic creepy line scenario. I have a little presentation Absolutely. I do on. You know, the, the borderline between genius marketing programs right. and just that's really awful is a very, very thin line. Off. Well, because have, you can you now have the information you go, let me look at everybody who had airline bookings or was right, looking at right. and do this and let's get them and let's convert them and you kind of go whoa hang <gasps> you know, right. hang on is that the right thing or and you can make equally good argument you know i i, yeah. I love you know when i do this presentation to come up with things where half the room is going to go no, that's completely fair game. That's right. And the other half is don't ever do that. That's that's the worst, right? And okay. yeah, in, trying to figure this, that out is a it's really funny. In interesting this, challenge. In this class I teach, I give three scenarios, and it's the exact same setup for all three scenarios, but the offer is different. And uh -huh. invariably, invariably, there is one person on the first offer who thinks it's creepy, and the rest of the class is completely fine with it. And by the right. third offer, Everybody thinks it's creepy except for one person, for one. Yeah. which always proves that, you know, the creepy line is kind of where the customer says it is. It is. Right. Well, you're going to find people true. who are cool with it. You're going to find people who hate it regardless of what you do. And you that know? is the bottom line is you do not control the creepy right. line. Right. It's in the individual perception of the of the receiver of that message. And that, right. again, that's hard to predict. So yeah. if you were going to target people, you know, I don't know that hard. I would be. If you were going to target people, and I would say, first off, tread lightly, right? Uh, but if you were going to target people, I would say you don't necessarily need to, you know, be um, be entirely transparent of we're targeting you because we know you had flights to Puerto Rico kind of thing. Like, that's just ugly. Right. Um, and right. maybe, if you want, take some of the earnings that you get from it and donate it to you know, relief programs <coughs> for those people or something, you know, and you don't have to promote that either, you know, like, right. <laughs> but, but you, you got to be it just completely somewhere else that they'll see. Uh, they'll tie it together. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, 
obviously you've got to do what's right for your business, but you know, try to grow the pie for everybody where you can, because that's yeah. always going to be a, a better strategy in the long run. Yeah. Right. No, I, I, again, it, it, it goes to the, the thought process of it is, is that these people now have to change their plans and that your product may not be, or your destination may not be of interest to them in, in comparison to what they had previously planned. And nothing about your presentation is in, in connection to them other than you are being able to identify that they were going in that direction of where they were going to be staying or what have you. Um, but it goes to offering them an alternative because if yeah. they were still planning oh, yeah. on traveling yeah. at that time and then featuring their feeder markets and who they were flying through also creates criteria as well. well uh, I, to Robert's point, you have great tools you can do this with now. I, I had a I had a, a situation with somebody I worked with. This is this goes back a few years, but they were in a in they were in a market that got hit with some some natural natural weather events, um, and they did some very very minor promotion, you know, and some very minor communications. And I you know I was part of this. I thought it was okay personally, basically just letting people know, hey, the lights are on, we're in business, everything's good, kind of yeah. thing, and took quite a bit of heat from other properties in the marketplace who were in oh, areas that were enough. more impacted yeah you know basically saying like dude what are you doing you know kind of thing right yeah um, it's a fine line it, it there's the, the, not there's not an easy answer to this one right no the, the analogy right. that i was talking about as i was going through this process of discussion with them it's a little a bit like flirting with the widow at the funeral <laughs> well, wow. no, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that's worse. I would think. <laughs> I don't know. I, remember when Tim I'm said, sure. "You know, when Tim said you asked the entire class, and there was one person who said that was okay." <laughs> I think you're that guy. <laughs> I'm the one that made that analogy as a, as a word of caution. I said, "Guys, good old, good old Lauren, just stomping like all over the line." <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't are put that moral line down. I think I, I just grew up a little wait, wait. bit. But I'll, oh, wait, I'll... A second. wait a second. We've got it now. The You're entering the gray zone where lines are meant to be crossed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one that put that line down and said, hey, wow. guys, think of it this By the way, way. I, think, I think we've just come up with a better name for the show. We really should just call the show the gray zone where <laughs> lines are meant to be crossed. Uh, first, of all, Greg. first of all, you are probably much easier to to find than this week in hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com forward slash Tipier Robert Cole Long Gray and St. Tom Stewart. I mean, the, the only thing that the only thing that makes that better, by the way, Ed, is the fact that we picked up about one word out of seven in that. You know, the <laughs> rest was <laughs> well, and the weird part is the only word we picked that we could hear was Ed. <laughs> we are. By the way, you heard me. I've got. I'm gonna, I'm gonna beat me. the joke to death because you know nothing's funnier than that. But henceforth, you will be known as Max Edroom. Max Edroom. Yes. Oh, Ed Edroom. Max Edroom. Edroom. Max Edroom. Edroom. Yeah. Holly's with us. I see that popped in. Yes, she's using us one day. Hey, Ed. <laughs> if we can get you where you're not gibberish, I'm Max Edroom. Um, we saved your Mac Rumors article until you joined us. Um, oh, good. So that you could chat this, about your gloom and doom on that one. There's some good and some bad with that. So can you guys hear me okay? Mm, off and on. No. Ah. Your oh, internet, I think, I think your, your security people are messing with it. You've got you to upgrade, you uh, upgrade your AOL account, Ed. I don't know. That <laughs> well, he's he's going up with it. Messenger. Messenger's <laughs> <That's cool. simple. laughs> I don't know. It's, it's Chrome. Can you can you log in with Safari? This is a crappy form. Yeah, you're getting you're getting terrible choppiness there. Well, we right, say what, while, while Ed while Ed is working through his technical difficulties. Oh, no audio That's though. That's better. No than, audio. That's per. Shh, don't tell him there's no audio. <laughs> All right. Now I'm low definition. How's that? Low. Oh, definition. that might be better. Oh, that might be better actually. Wow, he yeah. looks better too. Hey, it's funny how that works. <laughs> I tried to find a gray wall in my house so I could look like all you guys, but there isn't one. Oh, oh, oh! I got, I got, I got supplies behind me. I don't know. Anyway, so Mr. Ed. So yeah, so uh, the article that I shared, uh, I thought was good because Lauren, you and I were talking yesterday, we were asking, you know, really how impactful is iOS 11 going to be to marketers? 
And the article I shared is that already it's installed on 47% of the devices out there passing iOS 10. That's amazing. Which means, yep. Which and so here's be... why that's sorry. Go ahead. really interesting is so we've been spending a lot of time understanding um, deeper analytics of all of our different customers. And we have seen consistently where Safari, because it's browsers, when you look at it in analytics, actually is the number one browser. And yep. mobile is the number one device. Yep. So that means the fact is that 47% of our devices now are running iOS 11, which has a version of Safari cross domain. Um, you know, there was a big you know, uproar by the advertising industry about Apple doing this because that basically makes ad retargeting and, you know, all of those types of things uh, pretty much, you know, unusable for well, people who use those more, devices. more difficult pretty depending much. on where you're getting your retargeting from. Sure. Yeah, yeah. fair enough. Fair enough. But, but, you know, um, dynam dynamic Mac addresses, things like that. I mean, that's going to be – that is the real defining line now in the world of Apple versus the world of Google is, you know, Apple is like, we aren't selling what we know about you. That's right. not our business right. model. Right. And that is Google's business model. I mean, entirely. with being right. – right, <laughs> Entirely, yeah. And Facebook's. Yeah. Right, and Facebook's so, so, as well. So. so I think a lot of people with this iOS 11 update are – probably going to start wondering why they're seeing drops uh, in their different marketing. Uh, it's iOS 11. Now, yeah. on the positive side, these 47% of Apple devices now have native QR code support mm -hmm. right. inside right. the camera app, right. which means you can actually start using QR code uh, and actually not have to cross the, the big hurdle of someone needs to download an app. Well, so, and, and for everybody who is, everybody in North America goes, oh, QR codes, I hate them, things like that. Take a look at what's going on in China, <laughs> because you, yeah. you have situations with WeChat where you walk into a restaurant and that's the menu. You've got a QR code on your table. You shoot it, right? And you go, and then you order off of your phone. And how do right. you pay? The, the same way. You aren't interacting with a with a person. You don't need to. It's it's a better, in many cases, a better seamless experience. Um, and where do you have the people? You have them in the kitchen. You have you know cooks and runners. Basically, that's that's about it. Right. Yeah, I share so a, a New York Times article video with uh, when I was doing the rocket program. I played it about WeChat. It's a six minute video that gives you an idea of the inclusiveness of a single platform entity and how Messenger and places like that are trying to adopt that mentality uh, to it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a word of warning, you know, siren video kind of thing. And then the other video I, I love sharing is Facebook. Why is it so intent that Facebook wants to create Internet in third world countries? And it's a really great article well, also. Because Facebook has a problem uh, that they need to solve for. Uh, one is people aren't living long enough for their growth projections because their growth is starting to get to that. The other is not enough of the world has internet for them to hit their growth projections. Right, right. And so their real problem is they have to solve for getting internet to everyone so that they can get in, get their hook into those people's lives. And then a longer lifetime customer value offer. Ed, we're you're breaking we're, up badly uh, again. But it um, is getting I, some interesting will, kind of musical tones. I was thinking Tim could get the guitar and kind of play along. Absolutely, so. yeah. We got a little vocoder action going on. Um, I just posted a link. I want to go back to Ed's first comment um, with regard to how uh, Apple's tracking prevention uh, can hurt you. If you are using Google Analytics and you are using Google AdWords, um, you definitely, definitely want to click this link and follow the instructions or make sure your development team is or whomever your vendor is for your website uh, because it some things will break right out of the gate from a tracking perspective. Let's be really yeah. clear. This isn't this isn't your ads won't work. This isn't, you know, that your your messaging won't work or the like. It's that you won't be able to track how effective it is. Um okay. Uh, but if you take this step, your tracking will be fine. So uh, right. be aware of that, and you want to make sure that's in place. You know, 
here's the thing. I, I, I have a strong opinion about ad blockers and, and, and things like blocking cross domain tracking and the like, and it might surprise you. Um, my opinion is this is our fault. <laughs> ad blockers, ad blockers exist because advertisers have treated customers like garbage for the last bunch of years. Um, right. you know, either loading down sites with lots and lots of ads that uh, are very data intensive, that chew up data plans for folks on mobile, that respond slow, that hang browsers, that don't actually advertise anything anybody gives a good damn about, right? Right. So, yeah, or targeting for something that's just like so that. tangential yeah. that you're like, you know, you yeah. were targeting for a spa and you don't have a spa. You know, what is yeah. this sort of, yeah. This is why I like search. This is why I like email. This is why I like certain types of social, specifically social, where your customers, you know, the kinds of stuff that that Flip2 does so well, where your customers actually tell your story on your behalf. Because A, you can't ad block any of those. And B, nobody wants to, because you're actually being useful right. to the customer and helping the customer and and letting the customer tell their friends about what a great time they had at your property. So, right. you know, those methods still work. Those methods are really effective and, and people like them because they're not advertising. They're actually supporting the guest at the various stages of their journey where they right. happen to be. And so Ooh. I think that's a better approach, you know, not that I'm against retargeting or things along those lines, not that I'm against display advertising or anything, but more, they should complement what you're already doing and should be effective ads for the people who actually want them rather than the annoying garbage we've been putting up for years well, and years, and years that led people to want ad blockers in the first place. Right. And and in the case of Flip2, you're, you're amplifying a message, which is right. an authentic message, as opposed to just creating some something different, right? And right. trying to kind of tangentially, you know, glance off and, okay, we'll, we'll carve off 4% of these people and it's such a big group. That'll be, be fun. Not, yeah, pretty customer hostile. Yeah, <laughs> we, talk that, well, we talk about the display, adver the fact that display advertisers talk about, you know, 1% response rates like they are, you know, solving world hunger or curing yeah. cancer. And I'm just like, right, but you're also pissing off 99 <laughs> other people out of 100. Maybe or, you or training that. Or training Negative them to KPIs. just not, Exactly. Or, or, or yeah. train them to not look at it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You've right. got to... You know, you've got well, a behavior that's, that's rewarded because, yes, if I don't look right. at this, I will not be punished. So I'll just, you know. Right, right. Yeah. So, and that's why yeah. you have ad blockers. It's like, just Having stop people... the madness. I'm willing to pay money to not, you know, to not see this stuff. Right. Yeah. yeah. Having people just tune you out is far worse than having them love you or hate you. Yeah. Because yeah, even absolutely. they, the emotion, right? if they tune you out, you're done. Ed, we completely yeah. agree with every word of that we heard. Yeah. Oh man. Re remember <laughs> when I remember when I was trying to get on the thing driving in a car to Lubbock? It's kind of like yep. that. <laughs> this is terrible. Oh my gosh! Funny, yes. The funny part about this, Ed, the the funny part about this is the picture actually looks not that bad. No, I mean, realistically, yeah. the picture the is kind of fine. Was... The audio is total, total, total garbage. But the do, do, try, try shutting off I the can... camera for a minute, just leaving the audio on, and see if that does anything. So, how's the audio? Perfect. That was that Perfect. was good right there. So it's a bandwidth issue. It's bandwidth yeah. issue. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah, coming through an audio, and, is it's, and it's weird that it's Your prioritizing. Platform just can't handle seeing me and hearing me at the same time. It's too much awesome. That's, it, that's it, probably it, it. I'm. I think that is. I think. Yeah. There's. That's a, my story, a, and I'm sticking with it. Yeah. There's just know, too much. I, awesome I think on yeah. most most equipment, that is a new spec that you need to check when you're when you're looking at you know, any sort of new system. Is the which is why the awesomeness, Ed, awesomeness you, threshold. You can't use a 4K camera because no bandwidth's going to handle 4K. U. You know. You no. Just, no. Test. It ain't gonna like looking directly into an eclipse. Oh my gosh! Yeah, you, without the right lensing, you can't. Uh, yeah, <laughs> or, or 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 catching a glance of Medusa, similar sort of thing. Right. <laughs> or you know, it's, it's that whole part where the Germans looked inside the Ark of the Covenant, and yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> yes, and then just boom, there it was. Uh, oh my god! Yeah. Hey, um, some other things about now that we're kind of coming through this the the budget season on some things. Some of the other things I've noticed 
is that there have been a growing amount of questions associated with not mainstream things, uh, and like prepping, you know, prepping for things, uh, which is why through the article in about local backlinking, um, most people uh, that I talk to, one, don't even understand the difference. Well, first off, may not have a complete awareness of backlinks, link building in general, let alone localizing your backlinks, lo let alone cultivating local backlinks. That's usually a more advanced conversation. And, and um, either it's turned into a buzz phrase with the group of people I'm talking to, or they're digging a little bit deeper now in forward looking into 2018 saying, we have to start prepping for some things because we're going to start losing some positioning because we're not doing some of these things. Is that just, I mean, are you catching any of this from anybody you're talking with, or is this something you've already discussed with some people? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm going to be, I take a slightly more contrarian point of view on this. Um, you know, I, I fully agree. We want to have a healthy backlinking strategy. If obviously we're talking about restaurants or things like that, local backlinks certainly have their place and all that other kind of stuff. I think link building should be earned and link building works more effectively when it is earned. And typically you have more success in search and you have more success in social when you have content that people want to link to, that people want to like, and that people want to share. So if you're putting a lot of emphasis into, you know, going and driving links to some of your content, don't misunderstand. You want links, but it's easier to get them if you actually have content worth linking to. Yeah. So it's, if you're the putting most of your energy into the linking part and not into the content part, you've got your carts and horses in the wrong direction. Very good statement. Yes, but, but let's, let's face it. I mean, this industry falls victim to this type of problem in almost every form of marketing. Right. You know, the, uh, the gamification to try to get more likes and followers on social. Right. And then they're blown away that they have a million followers, but only on average two interactions per post. Um, right. You know, email databases that, you know, weren't acquired in the best ways possible. Right. And they're surprised that, but you know, look, they we have a huge email list. Yeah. Yeah, right. and I mean, like, so ill-gotten gains in marketing right. uh, will always result in low-quality results. Right. That's right. That's absolutely so, right. I agree with you. Kind of reason why I'm Whoa. Whoa. See, that wasn't me. No, that one was, that one was Lauren. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'll tell you a funny story. I, you know... Uh, the conventional wisdom is social's great for awareness and terrible for conversion, right? It's wrong. It's just no one's doing it right. Correct. Exactly. I just, I, that's why I said conventional wisdom. I just had a client who they put together a great offering. They put together some great materials. They built a really cool program at their property. Um, it has been very well shared on social. It has been very well liked and has driven a whole bunch of reservations from yeah. that directly, right? Yeah. Because it's a cool thing and people like it. And it has yeah. nothing to do with them gaming Facebook and has nothing to do with them gaming their followers, has nothing to do with any of that stuff. It's just a really solid offer and a really cool promotion. And it's not a discount. It's an actual experience that is distinct and unique. Wow. They built some really great content around it. People are is that legal? You can you can promote something without a discount, really. So That's so, but cool. here's the thing: like everyone, uh, like everyone I look at in social marketing in our space, they get it completely wrong. And the biggest thing they get wrong is they don't understand the state that the people are in, not physically, but right. their mental Mentally. state. Right. And so, if if you're doing social posts that drive to your website which only has one call to action that traffic is not going to convert well because a lot of the people you're catching you're catching someone who's being distracted from whatever it is they should be doing uh and they're looking to be distracted they're right. looking to be inspired they're looking to have an experience and you know, so you can't just say, I'm going to take the same ploy I took with Google AdWords, which is try to be present at some point, and then just send you to my one-size-fits-all right. experience. 
uh, that's really not one size fits all. It's one it's one size that fits people who've already made decisions on all of their other phases of travel and are now looking to book a hotel. Right. Like because let's be honest, that's most hotels websites only address that side. Right. So yeah, so yeah. so that saying that, but then also I, I take issue and I always laugh anytime anyone tells me any form of marketing doesn't work. Because that's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> what that means, what that means is, is they tried everything feasibly possible that you could try in that form of marketing, right. and none of it had any results. Right. But what yeah. realistically happens is they tried one thing uh, without understanding the medium, and. It didn't or the, go well. Or the customer. Right. Well, yeah. And uh, <laughs> so now it doesn't work. So the, right. saying that social doesn't work is um, for, for booking and for transactions, all that tells you is that person doesn't understand what they're talking about. <laughs> well, it goes back to something I mentioned way back, uh, you know, wow, a long time ago. I always thought there was two types of people. The people that will tell you the 99 things that they tried and failed at. And then the other people that just told you that they got it done, what you asked them to do. And they'll tell you the 106 things that they did if you're interested, but they kept recracking the nut until finally they found a solution to it rather than just, well, we tried everything we could think of to your point, Ed, you know, hey, it's, this is it. We did this. And, and I think we, we still exist under, unfortunately, a copycat society. Um, I, I talk about the three questions that usually come up in the C level. You know, how much is, revenue can we make from it? How much is it going to cost for us to make that revenue and who else is doing it? And then you look at other competitors that you uh, empathize with and you try to duplicate them. And to your very specific point, Ed, is the message sent from your competitor is not as well received or received in the same context, state of mind, as if you were to duplicate that and send it as your own. It doesn't mean you're receiving it being received by the same type of people in the same state of mind in that same micro moment, whatever you want to define it as, um, as the success potential that maybe your competitor did when they did it. And to that point, there's now great tools that you can use to finite out the, the engagement that your competitors' postings have done and actually interpret why they were successful or not with the people that received them and learn from the engagement, not the context of, yep. the, of the post itself. And, 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 and more interestingly, chances are your competitor just ripped off someone else who ripped off someone right. else who ripped a off copy someone of else. Copy of a copy, you know, yeah. Which was created by someone who was doing their very first experiment in that form of marketing ever uh, <laughs> and didn't yeah. at all understand what was going on. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and, you know, if I can add to that, you know, it's, I think it's great that those tools exist. How many people who are watching the show and you, Clearly, you don't have to show hands or anything along those lines. But sure. are you looking at the results of your own programs? Are you looking right. at, boy, when we shared yeah. this, did it get shared? When we liked this or when we posted this, did anyone share it or like it or the like? Right. right? So, yeah, learn from your competition and what they're doing well, but also pay attention to your own numbers and say, wow, when we do these kind of posts, they work really well. Or when we do these kinds of ads, they work really well. Maybe we should do more of that. And when we do these things that don't work, what should we be testing to try to fix them? Mm -hmm. right. so, yeah. Uh, by the way, I just noticed the time. I'm going to have to run here in a moment. So, uh, yeah, uh, um, you have to go put some more wood on the fire, Tim. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> we you're are obviously, here for that. you're obviously here for the, the only show? northern uh, yeah. located person on this uh, this show. Absolutely. Well, and I, I mentioned earlier, we we certainly haven't turned the heat on yet, but it's been in the 70s uh, up until oh. just a few days ago. Um, we had windows open last night when we went to bed and woke up this morning to a house that was in the 30s or so. Oh. <laughs> so, so that's uh, yeah. why you're wearing your Bill Belichick sweatshirt. It's, exactly. It's gotten, no, it's no. gotten much nicer during the day. But uh, uh, this is my this is my Go Cubbies. Uh, yeah, uh, okay. Hey, uh, Tim, I have a quick question for you. Yeah. If, 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 on your podcast, have you got an insurgence of an audience recently or your, your audience has grown uh, noticeably? Yes. Since? yes. That explains it then, because I, I was worried that because you were showing up in my feature listings now on Stitcher. And I thought, well, because I've, I listened to you, why wouldn't they feature it? But I also thought, no, they didn't. That hasn't happened before. We're just because I'm listening to a podcast regularly 
will it feature it? It actually was in the feature. So I mean, maybe you got to grow uh, an audience Tim's, that kind of brought Tim's, you up. Tim's about to uh, or start he just demanding did, he just a rider, of a rider before every show now. Like we're gonna have to deliver <laughs> green M and M's and yeah, yeah, we got brown M and M's at brown. brown. Brown, <laughs> Mr. No, no, you have to re- no, the, you have to remove the brown M&M. You have to remove the brown M&M. That's right. You don't want it, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, so they read no they read the writer. So that they know they read the writer. Right. Oh my gosh. All right, so Mr. I had to, I had to deal with all that in college. That was a, at the height of that in the late 70s, early <laughs> 80s. That was just Well, to the be worst. fair, to be fair to Van Halen, to be fair to Van Halen, the reason that that existed, right? People had to read the writer. For those of you who don't know, Van Halen had a writer where you had to have M&Ms in a bowl. One of the conditions was you had to have M&Ms in a bowl in the green room, and it had to have all the brown M&Ms removed. And the reason behind that was that somebody on their road crew or their road manager or somebody had worked with Mott the Hoople. And the lead singer for Mott the Hoople died when he was electrocuted by a poorly grounded microphone. Yes. At a concert venue. And so the whole point was, did they read the rider? And if they get the brown M&Ms wrong, did they do any of the other stuff that's going to end up getting somebody killed? Yeah. Polarity <laughs> is a powerful, powerful thing. Yeah, it like is. <laughs> it absolutely is. And that's where the brown M&Ms come from. So the Van Halen guys weren't just jerks. They actually were looking out for their best interests overall to say, did these folks actually read how to protect us and keep us safe. Of, of course, just to drop a name, a conversation I had with Bruce Springsteen, because on his rider, wow. 28, 28 ounce drops. steak, 28 ounce steak, right? Like T-bones. And he's like, can I please get like a piece of chicken or some box? <laughs> <laughs> steak. <laughs> They're like, yeah, yeah, no problem. So, yeah. We had, so Mr. He, Mr. Actually, we, we sent over the chef and had the, had the chef, like, make, I have no idea what they made for him. It's like, you know what we can do? We can do probably anything you want. Talk to the, we'll get someone who can help you. Yeah. <laughs> Which well, is true yeah. hospitality. Yes. As, you get, as you get more and more famous, Mr. Tim, we'll have more of them, you know, if we figure Ed eventually is not going to be on the show because he'll be on his yacht or something right. and right. he'll have some assistant join us or so, something. So, so Tim, being in New Jersey and you know the Savior Plane on Broadway, are are you uh, going for those fifteen hundred buck seats? To uh, I, if I had a choice between the Springsteen concert, who I've seen a couple of times, or or Hamilton, I would still take the Hamilton tickets, and both are yeah. both are still too tough a ticket to get. You know, I've, I've, yeah. I can think of other things I'd rather do with the money than than still? buy a ticket. Have you gone on StubHub to pick up? Go on StubHub. Uh, the last time I checked StubHub for, for Hamilton tickets, which admittedly was about six months ago, but the last time I checked there, a ticket was about a thousand bucks. And since it's a party of four, because uh, if I saw Hamilton and didn't take my <coughs> my my uh, college age daughters, they would you know murder me. Uh-huh. Um, you know, four four grand for one show. You know. I can think of other things. If I'd you if you <laughs> loved your daughters, Tim, you might, uh, now we know, now we know uh, how much uh, Tim loves your daughters. Actually, and, and what Tim, I'm actually doing is wait, keeping wait, the Tim. value of money. Look, here's uh, what I want you to do, Tim. I want you to tell them you got them tickets to see Hamilton, and then take them to see Moana, and say it's the same guy. I figured it'd be okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I, I'm thinking. Oh, no. I'm more from a business perspective, Tim, if your podcast is getting this, for everyone out there, if you're looking to sponsor Tim's podcast, <laughs> it's at a price tag of $4,000. <laughs> you can be sponsored on one of the most popular hospitality podcasts in the world. <laughs> and, that's, and that's for a 10-second micro spot, and he's got a no, lot of those 10 spots It would be like a flash ad in the front. That's about it. Mr. Tim, for those to find your podcast and to find you, oh, go ahead. So you can find me at timpeter.com. If you're interested in the podcast, it's at timpeter.com slash podcast. Uh, but you can find timpeter.com is every is the hub for everything. I'm on Twitter at TC Peter. Excellent. Excellent. Mr. Tim, I sincerely appreciate uh, joining and having fun with you as always. We missed you. I thought you like, I didn't even think you were be here because I thought you were in Oslo. So it was, it was a great pleasure to be able to have you pop back in. on. Well, and day. I, it's a shame because I've been, I've missed the last couple of weeks and I'm going to be in San Jose next Friday. So I will miss next Friday, unfortunately, but I will be back the week after that. So, uh, I, I will see you guys in two weeks. 
Uh, have a great rest of the day and have a happy Halloween if I see you before <laughs> see you until uh, after. Oh, no, I'll see you just before Halloween. So Just before Halloween. Uh, Good. By yeah, the way, gonna... that's a, uh, it's a costume show. Yeah, well, no, yeah, Ed, yeah, I'm Tim's, sure that's true. Uh huh. Tim, Tim is modeling his Violet Beauregard costume this this morning. Which <laughs> Bring is it great. a full circle. Bring it back <laughs> around. All right, gentlemen, all have right. a wonderful rest of the day, and I will talk to you all in two weeks. Okay. Thank you, Mister Tim. Thank you okay. as well. Bye. Bye now. Ollie, you did. You, you, I know that you're getting into this video thing because you shared a picture that of you in your your coding class that looked like Brady Bunch on steroids. What was there? Sixty people in the in the in the, the class, I don't know whether you guys saw our post on Facebook, but I think you need to make Holly join as a host. I do. I think you did. Holly, we, you can't, join we can't address her unless she's on camera. Uh, Wait, does, does the iOS up or no? Well, not iOS. Well, I don't know. The the Mac Mac OS can't we just turn our camera on remotely? Don't you know somebody at Apple who can just do that? Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> it was yeah, Tim Peter. Him. He's the one who does all the DoD stuff. Oh, that's right. <laughs> hey, there was one article, Ed, I'm glad you're here because I want to make sure that you get the chance to pop on this one. The analysis, are franchise fees worth the cost? I thought that was just like fertile ground of happy conversations because, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a great article. Though. <laughs> <laughs> I was like really hopeful for that article and I read it. I did. I, uh, yeah, I was hopeful that they were going to hit some high points, but they, they didn't. didn't. Just no. clickbait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. I just popped like up there. Most, you know, yeah. Like most news in our industry, it was yeah. uh, it was clickbait. Yep. Hey, but, did, did you guys talk about the Airbnb apartment complex in Florida? We did not, but that is an interesting. T- I I didn't send out a topic list this week, but uh, that was going yeah. to be. I don't know. I've just been too jammed with other stuff, but yeah, Point that out, is a it. very interesting development. Airbnb is developing apartment complex, or they're. Partner basically partnering. Oh yeah, I, I didn't grab that one. Yeah, you're right. I, I grabbed uh, another one afterward. Dirty data, the source of data that's harming your revenue performance, which I didn't share out. I was going to throw that in there too, but uh, yeah, was it just three that. giant letters that said PMS? Oh yes, you almost. Some of your dirty data. No, it's just again. I, I wouldn't say this is a strong article. It was really uh, here. I'm going to throw it up. Um, it was it was an article that just invoked a question more than actually gave an answer. They're basically referring that your denial data is tainted data because it's frequency of books, not necessarily cancellations of books. And so it can skew your uh, conversion values, traffic volumes, channel values, what have you. And I thought it was very trite because it's a very superficial or, or skin level view of looking at data. If you're taking that kind of data and taking it as fact as a conversion value or volume value, um, you, then you shouldn't be handling data at that point. Oh, look. Kelso, Kelso says hi. He just came up to visit. That is a big cat. <laughs> he is a very he's, he's, don't body shame my uh, cat. There's another cat. <laughs> yeah, no body shaming the cat. Ed, what's your cat's name? That's Gordon. 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 Like he's in Flash Gordon. That's the- I think that all animals should have ridiculous human things. Wait, Flash, uh, Flash uh, Gordon, uh, Commissioner Gordon? I don't know. It could be, yeah. <laughs> no, it's like Gordon Leibowitz. <laughs> Gordon or, or, yeah, Bare Naked Ladies Gordon? I don't know. There are just so many different. That, that was a music reference, folks, just for people who don't know that reference. So. <laughs> uh, t- t- uh, Holly says there's just too much uh, chaos in her surroundings right now for her to get on the camera. Yeah, she's probably just having a bad hair day. And doesn't want to hop on the camera. Holly Wait. would never have a bad hair day. Lauren. That's true. Yeah, you Holly, know that. Yeah. This is yeah. my uh, video avatar, Holly. So, That's yeah, right. you can use your dog. Yeah, I should do the video avatar. Although we seem to be having bandwidth issues today. I don't know. Your video avatars. I heard something. You, you promised something about video avatars, Lauren. Oh, I have it. I just. I actually want to, I think I'm going to have to do the show from home. I have better bandwidth at home than I do in my office. I think I'm being too cheap with my bandwidth. I got to amp it up, but it's a matter of availability. Uh, CenturyLink only allows up to uh, 80 gig. And uh, You can't get fiber there? <laughs> no, no fiber. DSL is all I can get. So I'm very we limited. Have, we, have a, uh, we have 100 symmetrical service with the CenturyLink in our office for 300 bucks a month. Nice, nice. Yeah. So anyway, uh, well, Holly, yeah. Um, 
any thoughts about the uh, the franchise cost? Just because we, we we shredded the article, the article doesn't have value proposition to it. But in this day and age, right now, what's the real value potential for brand compared to not going brand? Other than Mr. Ed, your amazing point out a few weeks back that if OTAs were to step into the financial aspect, we probably have less brand hotels because that's usually the large leverage point of why a hotel is started up as a brand because it helps with the financing. Yeah, um, you know, I I think brands need to rethink who they are now that they're asset late. Um, because I think their historic new propositions are just under attack and not as legitimate when they're not active players anymore. Um, yes, you know, so I've felt every time a brand has decided to go asset light is you're no longer with their services, um, you know, and loyalty program. But yeah, that's it. I mean, what what are your thoughts? You're Robert? you're kind of breaking up. I just turned off your uh, your web the cat cam the cat cam the cat, the cat cam. Yeah. So now we can. Why don't you repeat what you said? Because there, I think there was something in there that. Well, was, I said you know good. my my problem with brands now um, is they need to recreate their what their value proposition is. Uh, now that most of the brands have gone asset light, they. They need to think about what they are in the industry because a lot of their value proposition previously was they were hoteliers. It was you weren't just getting the distribution; you were getting the great education and led by a brand that you know leads the the pack in hospitality. Well, they don't own any hotels anymore, so are they really about hospitality anymore? Is my question. Right. And legitimately, uh, a lot of the value proposition i think some of these brands brought were the history of their hospitality and yeah. so it when you're an asset like brand i think you need to sharpen uh where you bring value and you should also be able to go toe to toe with things that compete with those value propositions uh mm -hmm. i.e otas um marketing you know i mean i i still question some of these brands' decisions that they make in marketing um, because <laughs> they, they erode their own databases um, constantly. If you look at the email marketing of some of these brands, there's, there's no way their databases are getting really good uh, response rates and things like that because there's no way consumers are putting up with what basically is spam. Right. Yeah. And I don't have the article i believe saber is um there was an article well i might have it here saber reimagines lodging with new content services solution to expand current offerings and drive new growth um it appears that after decades of resisting multiple representation that the um that basically I believe Sabre is going to come in and allow multiple representation of individual, of individual properties, which is going to be even worse for the, uh, for the brand. So you can start saying, yeah, I want this property, but I'm buying it through this channel dynamically on the, yeah. And that's, the that's really bad news for the brand because then uh, all property corporate. owners, yeah. yeah, property owners are going to know truly what the brand's contribution is at that point. Yeah. And it is going to be grossly, grossly disappointing for them. Yeah. Because, again, out of the corporate segment, you know, what, if it wasn't contracted at a, what, a national corporate rate by somebody in a regional sales office or something like that, it's just going to be, hey, this is our local corporate rate. This is us and its location. And who really knows it's because of the brand halo effect or, or not. But, yeah, that's it's brand margins and things like that are going to start getting a – start getting stressed and then they're going to start buying hotel assets <laughs> yeah yeah exactly no a couple other things um and this yeah, but, they, but they're but they're actually their um their investors won't allow them to do that i mean it's it's terrible yeah you've got you've got situations where they're sitting there going no no you can't start spending on this and and start you know making the balance sheet look ugly by by acquiring these assets what's the roi on 
and they they get themselves over a barrel, right? They just kept cleaning stuff up with kind of their business model. Look, hey, look at how nimble we are and lightweight, and we're just like a you know we can compete with against investments in a dot com. And you're like, yeah, now you're kind of competing directly with a dot com, and that's yeah. not. Yep. And and hey, guess what? Your your labor cost structure is out of whack, and yeah. you you aren't just a pure technology play. And now you want to go expand your asset base. I don't think so. So yeah. yeah. So they'll but keep consolidating. Three three things to the process of this, I think, are part of, worthy of the discussion. One is there was another value asset about a brand being able to offer purchasing power, where because of their collaboration, you're able to because of the brand standards and what was being purchased, be able to get into uh, lower cost structures associated with product. That's no longer true. It's now bloated in the reverse. Now you're actually being constrained by those purchasing requirements and not allowed to be varying as to what vendors you can work with because there, there's the politics of being an authorized vendor, authorized product and everything else like this. So now it's counterproductive. It's costing you more to deal with the brand relationship requirements than it was what brand pricing they brought down to you. The other is, is that I think it also uh, does disallows flexibility to your market. You're not able to customize your hotel product to the market sensitivity because your first answer always has to be brand requirement before there's any logistical local requirement that you can, and then there's just some walls you just can't get past. No matter how much you want to do something based on the reflection of the local market, you can't because it's in violation of brand standard that you have a flag for. So there's right. that component to it too. Um, and to your well, point, it also- same, same with property improvement programs, right? So the right. brands now are going, there's going to be more pressure on what getting ahead of the game and having something that's really going to be the cool thing in six, you know, 18, 36, 50, you know, you know, 60 months. Um, that's tough to go sell to an owner who's going, no, nah, I don't know. That's looking a little bit, you know, that's risky. Not to keep piling on this, but, you know, have you noticed how the ass, the newly asset light brands have become obsessed with in, in room technology? Oh yeah. Gee, I wonder why they're trying to make their key differentiation, the on property, uh, you know, differentiation. Yeah. Could it be because it doesn't cost them anything? Right, uh, right. <laughs> well, and, and, and I really look at this game where they're putting in iPads and all this stuff in the room. And you go, wait, stop. It's a it's horrible, a, horrible it's idea. the worst strategy you can have. It's like, no, they're bringing their own device. BYOD. That's the whole thing. Well, yep. Ed, I don't think you're right. We were talking about WeChat um, earlier in China and things like that. I mean, they have eliminated so much technology there is no point of sale system in the restaurant at all yeah. you know it's, it's it's not there it's all cloud driven because you you scan the qr code you put you know you make your order yes the kitchen can go see what the order is because it's got an internet connection and that's about it and then you pay on it too so you don't need any and there's no cash involved right, right. it's just it's purely you know digital seamless and it's fantastic and so, yeah, you know, that would be the equivalent of restaurants going, yeah, we're going to go put an iPad at every table, you know, or for every person at the four top. I, Man, you, so you, think about, you think about in a market like China where WeChat's doing that for restaurants, you could build a hotel model without a property management system. Right. Absolutely. Could you imagine yeah. you show up to a lobby, you scan a QR code, it tells you what floor to go to and what room to go to. You scan that QR code, it gives you your price your terms, everything like that. You pay it, it unlocks the door. Yeah. Oh, no. And hey, let me tell you, I spent a couple of days with Oracle a few weeks ago. They're, the POS system is doing freaking amazing stuff because they've gotten it all under their cloud platform and doing everything. Yeah. They, hotels, not there. In, in fairness to Oracle, they've got a pro, it's not Oracle's problem. They're ready to move everybody to the cloud. That's great. It's but all the hotel owners and everything going, oh, we've got, what about all these interfaces? And yeah. you go and look through Oracle's interface doc. I don't even know what the, the point is to the type is probably four. It's got to be under six. <laughs> it's 88 pages long. I yeah. mean, it's just insane of all this crap that's, still out there and I believe live and supported still because somebody's got something really old. Uh, well, yeah, so someone, severing someone all at that. some point paid the 25 grand to certify the connection. So that's right. 
Yeah, yeah right. exactly. Well, and, and the other side we were talking about Africa and things like that. The interesting thing on mobile there is they just leapfrogged over it. There's no copper buried in the, you know, right. in the dirt sort of thing. Yeah. It's all mobile. And they don't have yeah. to deal with all that infrastructure. Right. So that's how they all get of a sudden, paid. yeah, that's right. They get paid on their mobile devices for work. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Well, and there's yeah, also and everybody's got yeah, they've got it some sort of checking account, debit account, whatever it may be, um, Bitcoin well, account. I think, <laughs> I think you know, a bit of the head with Saber looking at the fact that there's going to be multiple representations and it's going to expose the true brand benefit that, that they keep touting but never can verify. Um, two other things is the other is that you have to share marketing and so without a direct benefit to yourself, you have to contribute to the right. larger machine and it's not really directly benefiting you. You have you have brand saturation in market because the multi-layer franchise agreements of very close to tier type branding so they can oversell a market uh, to other owners. And you're trying to share that space with a pretty similar demographic opportunity for, for market share. Sure. Um, there, there's those things. Um, all, all of that where, uh, like how the rocket program I was doing with, with Bonnie, Bonnie Burkhardt is really phenomenal when it comes to interpreting some data. And she was trying to demonstrate to the revenue teams that we were talking to the brand cost beyond what they market, what they, they account for. And it is invasive is, a, is probably a, a nice way of saying it. Every facet of every component, if you start adding all the brand costs associated with the transactions that are being generated and, and use that as a measure of cost to acquisition, it is staggering the cost value that you're getting sucked from for every dollar you're bringing in the door on top line. Um, oh. Absolutely. Well, and some of that stuff is, it was intentional from the brand. I mean, the whole um, virtual card, right, for settling yeah. merchant bookings. Yeah, I wrote the requirements for that. And that was not a strategic thing. That was a horribly bad idea. That was so you could get money that, you know, that a wholesaler or intermediary had down to a hotel immediately and seamlessly. It was supposed to be an ACH outbound transaction. Just give us an account number. It will be there. No, it, you know, it costs us a nickel to give you your money. That's fine. It's done. And no, all of a sudden, structurally, you've got all these, you know, percentage, basically it's your, your discount rate on your credit card. And that's now a thriving business. All these people are looking at these virtual cards going, wow, look at this and how much money they're making. Can we do this for air, you know, investors looking at investment services, go do it in airlines. And then you go, Airlines have ARC. You aren't going to do that. Right. It's already a, fr a fraction of the co It's costing them 25 cents, 50 cents a, a transaction. No, they aren't going to do it for a couple percent of the, uh, right. you know, of the tax. Well, so. and, and you brought it out there. Franchise, the only people that benefit from franchise operations is the franchisee or franchisor, excuse me, franchisor. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because at the end of the day, they're making money for doing nothing more than giving you the product that you're using as a flag. Yeah. So, Oh, yeah, they built a brand, and, and that's why Subway's the largest restaurant chain in the world, right? They're everywhere. They're easy to install that, but you pay heavily for that for that franchise. And if you don't want to be a Subway, you can go be a whoever's sandwich shop and knock off the concept. But, yeah, I mean, and so in some cases, yeah, franchises are good, but what's happening with these asset light things and having, you know, 15, 30 brands, which are overlapping, um, isn't, you know, it isn't a pure marketing reason to yeah. have that. Um, right. and yeah, it's, it's, it's getting very, very cloudy and that's not good. You don't want, you want clarity in your franchise you know, world. Um, yeah, gray, gray, the gray area is not good. In not situation. good. Not good. The gray zone, um, the gray zone. Gray zone, yeah, no. So, with uh, any of the other articles that uh, caught your eye, I mean, we talked about some Ed, before you joined, uh, but was there anything else that kind of popped up with you guys that you were interested to make sure we hit before we closed up? I decided to approach this week the way you guys do, of just being totally unprepared and not having any news articles, but because I've been busy. Dang! But, uh, I can take. <laughs> Dang! My yeah, gosh, hello. that was passive aggressive. <laughs> no, no, that was that was that was straight out aggressive. There was no passive. There was no bad. Passive. <laughs> He's just bashing. It's all right. It's all right. Haters going to hate. That was a that was a direct a direct diss. Yes. Yeah. My, my eight year old aunt or something. Well, if that's the way you're going to have to be about not visiting, I understand. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks, Robert. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Great thing. Yeah. Um. um well, that'd be the case unless Holly... Do... 
we can always talk about crypto tokens and uh, Bitcoin. How high is it going to go? Well, keep well, if, if it's, it's going to crash. Yeah. It's going to yeah. Well, I think it's also when you talk about. I think the thing, the conversation, like, the best benefit that came out of all this right now is just the fact that blockchain is a discussion point, but it's way ahead of itself when it comes to what we're going to see as the impact value in the in the in the media future. I well, think it's going to have an impact, but I don't think it's going to be in the next 12 the, months. The really interesting thing is all these ICOs, which are initial coin offerings yeah. to fund these um, these ventures are just getting crazy where groups with virtually no business plan, no technology, nothing, just you know, a sheet of paper are getting, if not tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars um, in value to go... Uh, to go do this stuff right. and yeah. that's now a business model right and well, who knows look at Venezuela. Stuff Venezuela, that's one of the uh, underground support financial systems that are existing right now is yeah. is uh, cryptocurrency and mining it i mean that's where I, can, somebody I can give you a fun topic that's completely on hospitality related uh what do you guys think of these car uh brands starting to come out with these membership programs where you can oh. Porsche. Just have you can just two Porsches, grand a month, yeah. two grand a month, and actually, if you do the math on that, that's right. It's it's actually a deal because it includes all the detailing, all the maintenance. There's unlimited yeah. mileage, um, yeah. and you can switch <coughs> between like five cars, and it's not the bottom barrel version of the car; it's the nicer right. version of the car. Yep. Yeah. No, so, I think that's that's these these auto manufacturers have to come up with new business models because going out and buying a new car and driving it off the lot um, is not right. a great value proposition. Depreciation, depreciation on a Porsche 911 that cost <laughs> over $100,000 in the first yeah. year is $27,000. So right. the, the Porsche plan they're offering for the 911 and Panamera, the high-end ones, that yeah. one's three grand a month. That's just the depreciation on a single car. Right. So, yep. you know, when you look at that, it's it's brilliant from a consumer play for the early adoption. But you know who actually I'll bring it to travel. If I was a rental car company, I'd be very concerned about that. Yeah. Because yeah. if you have a membership with a global brand to be able to have your choice of many different cars, you know the next thought's going to be when you're traveling. This That's is right. the extra perk. Now you get to drive a Porsche instead of having to rent a car from someone. Well, and and not just it's a Porsche. You want a black one or a red one right. or, a or something like that, um, which, again, is a whole different model. Where, you know, when we were writing the original open travel specs, that was one of the things um, with the car rental working group. We're saying, do we want to build the spec down to that level? Of specific? And they're like, no. No, you do not. Nobody wants that. It's like, wait a second. You've well, got such the consumer you've does. Got cases, <laughs> yeah, you've got use cases where there's a wedding and they want six baby, you know, Robin Egg Blue Carreras. <laughs> like, I mean, right. who, who knows? And you can probably get a pretty good rental fee on that <laughs> sort yeah, of yeah. thing. So, but yeah, but they're just like, no, 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 no. You just want so Volvo's, you know, Volvo's doing it with their XC60. Yeah. Um, and I believe Hyundai is doing it somewhere else in the world. <coughs> um, yeah. And theirs is like $250 a month for the Hyundai. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but this membership base, if you actually think about it, it's the, it's the brands trying to get ahead of the automated car movement. Yes. They want to start oh, training absolutely. the consumer to feel comfortable having their brand loyalty without ever owning right. the asset. Absolutely. Well, it kind of goes, I mean, I think one of the instigations of that whole conversation, remember when Silver Car popped out as a uh, rental, you know, where oh, yeah. you could always just get the same good quality car no matter where you went to and stuff. I think it made people realize that if you wanted to be brand loyal to something and still use it in the context of, you know, because, I mean, face it, when, when you go to rent a car like National or whatever, you have your preference of car type, what fits you best, what you like driving, you get into this preference mode. So this right. is just a great amplification of saying, hey, if you like that, be loyal to the brand. And now here's this membership opportunity. And yeah, add to your point, it's just the next step towards getting you comfortable with the idea. Hey, I need a pickup today because I got to move some stuff. And tomorrow I'm going to need a family van because I got to bring the kids. And the next day I want to bring the wife out on a nice sporty job when we go out for dinner. 
Yeah. Okay. How do you sell more two seat sports cars? By allowing that person to use your SUV anytime they need an SUV. Right. That's how you sell more two seat sports cars. Yep. Yeah. <coughs> Very true. Very true. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I and, think it's a mark. Well, and, and the car industry and or the um the auto dealers, things like that, are doing some really amazing things when you start looking at local, you know, local marketing and targeting people and personalizing where they're really looking at the offline or the online to offline experience and they they are now they have technology in place which is very cool where yes if you were all over the page looking at that red convertible before you went to the you know just the black SUV page and you and you arrange the test drive for that black SUV that's that's great. You know, all of a sudden that red thing is going to be right next to it. It's going to be yep. warmed up. It's going to be polished. And oh, what a coincidence. And oh, the person you did the chat with who was kind of assigned to your thing, when you show up on a you know Saturday afternoon just looking around the lot is going to which is now harder with some of the things that Apple's doing with the right. with the Mac addresses and things like that. But again, if people have completely opted in and they're, you know, engage with the brand all of a sudden it's like ed what a coincidence i'm here how are you doing it's joe we chatted and right. yeah really yeah. really sophisticated well, I, can tell you, yeah. I can tell you that one of the best fertile places of, of, of filtered and focusing on a campaign that i had was based on the car type that people were driving um there was a private club that was looking to do a summer membership and a very expensive one and we were trying to do some great targeting on facebook it turns out that people that drove bmws were our most fertile group of people because they seem to equate with the idea of having a temporary affluence over a summer period and it cost them X number of dollars. I mean, obviously there's other criteria about income levels and locations and sure. all that stuff. But when we spread it out between Bentley drivers versus Mercedes drivers versus, you know, BMW, BMW drivers tend to be the most responsive, click through, engaging group filter wise. And we still don't know exactly why, but I'm sure. I know why. It's because your because buttons look because your buttons look like turn signal indicators, <laughs> and so BMW people don't know how to use those buttons, so they went the one path where everyone else knows what a turn signal indicator is. Uh, oh, see, <laughs> see, I thought I thought the ult you had some sort of link for the persona for the ultimate driving machine to be the uh, ultimate, you know, whatever. The ultimate, yeah. ultimate sleeping machine. experience. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> guys hey all right so we're at the two hour mark yeah plus uh mr ed i'm sorry about your bandwidth or about the bandwidth we're having today or whatever but if people want to find out more about you and flip to where can they find you uh flip.to or on any of the many social media sites edward st orange and mr robert with rock cheetah where can they find you you can find me at rockcheetah.com or at robert k cole Robert K. Cole. And for any archives of these shows, this show and past podcasts and everything else, you can go to hospitaldigitalmarketing.com. For this, it's show number 114. Uh, type that in. It'll bring you to the show notes and all the links of the stuff that you didn't see in the chat room uh, and additional links to other conversations that we may have had. With that, um, Holly, thanks for being in the background with us. Although you didn't do any fact checking with us. We probably said some things that weren't right. And you're just being nice to us and not correcting for us because oh. you're probably buried in that coding class. And there, I think we need a sponsor for this show. I think there's something something down in Florida called Lorene Inc. or something like that. I don't know. That I, that's, I think, that's, that's I think they would be a great – I think they would be a great prospect. Great sponsor. Yeah. And, and you know what? Dean Schmidt Dean Schmidt noticed why it was Lorene because Renee is my wife, and we overlap by three letters, so they thought it was romantically cute. I'm like, yes, that's where it came from. But, yes, Lorene A uh, in my office space in uh, Hospital Digital Marketing. But, anyway um, – <laughs> What else is there? That's it. So uh, we might have a guest next week. Thanks, Mr. Ed. Uh, we get to be determined. Um, we're seeing if we can nail that down. And uh, we got Alex coming back from Alice soon. Uh, and we have one other. We have three guests on the docket coming up over the next four weeks. So we're probably going to have You're some guest hosting through. So thank you very much. And with that, I guess we'll wrap it up for today. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Appreciate, as always, the time spent and uh, making it through, regardless of the technology difficulties we may have had. And until next Friday, 11.30 Eastern, uh, for show number 115, we'll see you and talk to you all then. Bye now. And Ed, it was nice to see your smiling face on your little... Your yeah, little, you know, um, at, at least the avatar's there, right? Um, yeah. Got it.